Austin City Council. Viewers can watch the council meeting live on YouTube at, at boston.gov forward slash city dash council dash TV. At this time, I ask my colleagues and those in the audience to please silence their cell phones and electronic devices. Thank you. Before we begin, I would like to say, is she, is she in here? I would like to say a very big welcome back to our essential staff director, Michelle Goldberg. <laughs> Levitt. Come up here, Michelle, just so the people at home can see you. <laughs> Welcome back, Michelle. We missed you. Congratulations on being a mom. <laughs> awesome. <laughs> Mr. Clerk, will you please call the roll to ascertain the presence of a quorum? Council of Braden. Oh. Just in time. <laughs> Council of Braden. Yes. Council of Coletta. Council of Durkin. Council of Fernandez Anderson. Yeah. Council of Fitzgerald. Yeah. Council of Flynn. Yeah. Council of Louis Jean. Here. Council of Mejia. Yeah. Council of Murphy. Yeah. Council of Pepin. Yeah. Council of Santana. Yeah. Council of Weber. Yeah. And Council of Worrell. A quorum is present. Thank you. I have been informed by the clerk that a quorum is present. It is my pleasure to introduce this week's clergy, Father Joseph Zhang from St. James the Greater Church in Chinatown, invited by Councilor Flynn. Councilor Flynn, would you like to come up to the podium with your guest? Reminder to all, I would ask all my colleagues and guests to rise at the time of invocation, and after the invocation, please remain standing as we recite the Pledge of Allegiance. Councilor Flynn, you now have the floor. Thank you, Madam Chair. I'm honored to have Father Joseph Zhang from St. James the Greater Church in Chinatown to pray with us this afternoon. Father Joseph was born in China and ordained in the priesthood in 2004. He served in Manila in the Philippines and was here in Massachusetts in 2013 in Sturbridge. In 2018, he was assigned to St. James the Greater Church in Boston's Chinatown, which has a large Catholic community. In 2019, the Cardinal appointed him as administrator of St. James Church. Father Joseph is the first priest of Chinese descent appointed as a parish administrator in the Archdiocese. He is a great asset and a great member of the community. It is great to have him here and to pray with him. And he's going to pray in Mandarin and in English, and my assistant, Vanessa Wu, will translate some of that into a, a small prayer, very brief prayer, in Cantonese as well. Father Joseph, we're honored to have you. which is such a wonderful honor to be here with all of you, with all the representatives of the city of Boston where I live, and to pray together. Let us take a moment to silence our heart in the middle of the day. And we begin in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Lord, as we gather together, we recognize our differences in beliefs, values, and faith traditions. But we honor our unity here at the meeting today with gratitude. Thank you for giving us the ability to love and to be loved, for helping us recognize those little God moments in the beauty of your creation and for working on the lives of the people in Boston. <clears throat> Lord, I'm also grateful for choosing all valued city council members 
and inspiring them to make valuable and excellent decisions for your people in this city. Inspire them to be men and women for and with others all the time. Let us be unified in our fight to be for and with the marginalized, the poor, and the oppressed, as that is what you have called us to do. Thank you for opening our hearts as we listen to the needs of all in this loving city. Lord, bless the work we have done and the unseen work we will do through this council meeting as we strive to make a difference in the world. Fill us with, the us with the enthusiasm and wonder as we receive these gifts with open minds, generous hearts, and a willing spirit. Chenyung Heavenly Father, we come to you today asking for your guidance, wisdom, courage, and strength as we begin this meeting. Be with us in our deliberations and help us make wise decisions so that everything we do might begin with your love and be carried out through your grace. In the name of our risen Lord, Jesus Christ. Amen. And in Chinese, to pray the glory be. Amen. Amen. We will now recite the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you, Father, for that wonderful prayer. Shishi, uh, thank you. We are now on to presentations. I'm excited to invite up the Dever School Band, invited by Councilor Fitzgerald, Council Fitzgerald, would you please come up to the podium with your guests? Thank you, Madam President. Uh, I've long said that a, uh, the three pillars to any successful society is, is uh, academics, athletics, and the arts, right? A uh, different kind of AAA bond rating. Um, and today is an important part of that. Uh, today I have with me Christopher Schroeder, the executive director of the Boston Music Project, uh, along with Andrew and Alex and the Dever School After School, uh, the Dever School After School Music Program. The Boston Music Project has been a proud partner of the Boston Public Schools for over 12 years. Each year they provide 2,100 youth with weekly, before, after, and in-school music education across 23 school partnerships with a team of 56 talented teaching artists. The Dever After School program has been growing over the past three years, providing essential after school care for youth and families. Uh, Chris, I'm gonna invite up right now. Uh, he could say a couple words, uh, and, and, and maybe rather some actually unfortunate words. 
uh, and then we will have uh, uh, the band do a little uh, a number for us afterwards. Chris. Thanks so much. Yeah, thank you. Thank you, everyone. Uh, we've, we've been here a couple times now performing and sharing the work that we, uh, we do across the city. Six years ago when I joined the organization, we were at one school, at the Quincy School. We had 150 students. We had 17 teaching artists. And over the last six years, we've been able to address a lot of the needs across the city. And we've expanded the work to now 23 school partnerships. Uh, and now serving over 2,100 students. Some of the other work that we're doing is we're hiring students over the summer. We have, through the SuccessLink program, hiring 15 students, not to fold papers and make, learn how to you know, copy and collate and that sort of thing. Their job is to record a, a music album at the Record Co., to produce live concerts around the city. The Downtown Crossing, the Boston Bid, has uh, signed on to uh, sponsor us to, to bring about Boston's first youth music and arts festival uh, to Downtown Crossing. And uh, we're also doing Make Music Boston, which is uh, a proclamation from the city. Uh, Mayor Wu has signed off to allow us to activate in eight neighborhoods, bringing music to all parts of Boston, not just the downtown area, but ensuring that all community, communities and neighborhoods are represented. So we've continued to work and expand uh, and address these important needs. We've seen impacts in a positive way to academics, the attendance uh, in various schools, the challenge that we're facing right now is there are significant budget cuts, both at the city and the state level. And the unfortunate news is some of these programs will be no longer next year due to some of those, those, just, uh, those budget cuts. And I understand the challenges that we all face as city leaders uh, and state leaders, but I think it's important for the students here uh, and in our communities to know that we are supporting them and we are creating opportunities so that every child in Boston has access to music education and a well-rounded educational experience in our Boston school. So I'm very excited to welcome the Boston Music Project students at the Dever School, the Chamber Orchestra. You're going to hear students that are all in grades two, three, and four, right? These are very young people and we've been, that's all right, yeah, that's absolutely right. And they've been doing an amazing job over the last three years as we've been building this program. So I'm excited for you to hear them and, and see them. And uh, thank you so much for the opportunity. Thank you so much for the opportunity to play here today. Have a wonderful day.
Um, can, can, maybe we can have them, are they playing another song? Yeah. One more? Okay. I was going to have them do it from the podium so that everyone can hear, but it's okay. Can't hear. Actually, have, have, have played, Actually, can we have each one as you introduce yourself? Come up here Wait, in front of this podium. Play, you can why introduce yourself. Why don't we have them play the last song and then do the introduction? Okay, yeah, play the last song and then you'll come up here and do it. Mm -hmm. mm Now, if they can each want to introduce themselves on this mic, you can come here. We'll start with you, Ede. Just say your name and what grade you're in. Hi, my name is Ede, and I'm fourth grade. And, and I play the violin. Hi, my name is Aminata. I'm eight years old and I play the violin. Awesome. Hi, my name is Nicolette and I'm eight years old and I play the violin. Hi, my name is Caitlin. I'm nine years old and I play the violin. Hey, my name is Carla. I'm eight years old and I play violin. <clears throat> Hi, my name is Evelyn. I'm 10 years old and I play the viola. Hi, my name is Aiden. I put it down for you. <laughs> you want to turn so that they can see you? Okay. Hi, my name is Aina and I have seven years and I play the cello. Awesome. Hi, my name is Emmett and I am 11 years old and I play the cello. Hi, my name is Nico. I'm 10 years old and I play the cello. Awesome. You all were incredible. Please clap it up for the <laughs> Colleagues, join us for a photo. Can we take a photo with all of you? Yes. yes? Awesome. Okay. Hi. Yeah, E Day and Evelyn, right? Awesome. Miss Ida told me about all of you. You guys are amazing. Can I stand here with you? You guys are amazing.
Evelyn. Fitzgerald. I know their teacher, Miss Ida. You want to come on? Come on. Yeah, one more. One more. One more. Okay, can you see your one? I think it's I just heard all your classmates. I'm watching this with you. Yeah, they are. They are. <laughs> you want to say hi? You guys did such a great job. Thank you. Yeah, I know. They're great. You can come back here when you're a city councilor yourself. Awesome. Chris, the Boston Music Project, Councilor Fitzgerald, thank you. Thank you to all the students at the Dever. Um, I know that uh, Councilor Fitzgerald stated all of the school is watching. Miss Ida told me, a good friend of mine, a teacher there, I've had the pleasure of going there, told me that, that everyone is watching. Um, and Ide, Evelyn, everyone's just so great. So thank you for bringing that joy into our chambers. We really appreciate it. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Mr. Clerk, would you please amend the attendance to reflect that Councillor Worrell and Councillor that Councillor Worrell is now present and with us? Thank you. I also wanted to recognize a group of students from the Lycée Auguge in Grenoble, France, participating in a Boston Latin School Student Exchange Program. Salut, bienvenue ici à Boston. Thank you for being here with us. Merci beaucoup. Hein? Merci. Uh, we are now on to the first order of business, which is the approval of the minutes from the meeting of March 27, 2024. All in favor say aye. aye. All opposed say nay. The ayes have it. The minutes of the last meeting are approved. We are now on to communications from her honor the mayor. M yeah. Mr. Clerk, would you please amend the attendance, ref uh, the attendance to reflect that Councillor Coletta is now with us and is present. We are now on to communications from Her Honor the Mayor. Mr. Clerk, would you please read dockets number 0631 and 0632 together. Docket number 0631, message in order for your approval. In order to reduce fiscal year 24 appropriation for the reserve for collective bargaining by $4,909,838 to provide funding for the Boston Police Department for the fiscal Year 24 increases contained within the collective bargaining agreements between the City of Boston and the Boston Police Detectives Benevolent Society Superior Officers Unit. And docket number 0632, message in order for a supplemental appropriation of, for the Boston Police Department for fiscal year 24 in the amount of $4,909,838 to cover the fiscal year 24 cost contained within the collective bargaining agreements between the City of Boston and the Boston Police Detectives Benevolent Society, Superior Officers Unit. The terms of the contracts are July 1st, 2020 through June 30th, 2023, and July 1st, 2023 through June 30th, 2025. The major provisions of the contracts include base wage, base wage increases of 2%, 1.5%, 2%, 1%, and 2.5% to be given in July of each fiscal year of the contract term, as well as the addition of the Transitional Career Award Program in July 2023. The contract also contains reforms relating to discipline, officer return to duty, pay detail system, and union release. Filed in the Office of the City Clerk on April 1st, 2024. Thank you. Dockets number 0631 and number 0632 will be referred to the Committee on Ways and Means. Uh, I want to also say again thank you to the additional guests who are here who are part of the Liceo Gouge Exchange Program. Thank you for being here uh, in the Via Boston Land School Student Exchange Program. Thank you. Bienvenue ici à Boston. Uh, hope you are enjoying it. And to another special guest, we have Miss Ida, who is here with us. So hi, Ida. Thank you for being here with us. 
I was just reminded that, yes, I want to shout out. She's the best in our office. Okay, we are, um, thank you, Mr. Clerk. Would you please read docket number 0633? Docket number 0633, message in order for your approval in order authorizing the City of Boston, acting through its Mayor's Office of Housing, to accept and expend payments in the amount of $40 million given to the City of Boston's Inclusionary Development Policy Fund. The City of Boston's Inclusionary Development Fund was established by executive order in February 2000 to support the production and preservation of affordable housing and new market rate housing developments. Thank you. Docket number 0633 will be referred to the Committee on Housing and Community Development. Mr. Clerk, would you please read dockets number 0634 and 0635 together? Docket number 0634, message not authorizing the City of Boston to accept and expend the amount of $346,000 $835 in the form of a grant for the Federal Fiscal Year 24 Senior Companion Program awarded by AmeriCorps to be administered by the H. Strong Commission. The grant will fund administration of the Senior Companion Program, including reimbursement for travel and meals, plus stipend for volunteers who provide companionship to homebound and frail seniors. Docket number 0635. Message in order authorizing the City of Boston to accept and expend the amount of $140,253 in the form of a grant for the Fiscal Year 24 Retired Senior Volunteer Program <coughs> awarded by the Corporation for National and Community Service to be administered by the H. Strong Commission. The grant will fund administration for senior community service volunteers, including reimbursement for meals and travel expenses. Thank you. Dockets number 0634 and 0635 will be referred to the Committee on Strong Women, Families, and Communities. Mr. Clerk, would you please read dockets number 0636 and 0637? Docket number 0636, message in order for the confirmation of the appointment of uh, Paul Raber Umfenor II as an alternate member of the Four Point Channel Landmark District Commission for a term expiring March 19, 2027 and docket number 0637. Message in order for the confirmation of the appointment of Hassan Faruqi as a member of the Building Emissions Reduction and Disclosure Review Board, also known as BIRDO, for a term expiring March 19, 2027. Thank you. Dockets number 06. Oh, the chair recognizes Councilor Durkin. Councilor Durkin, you have the floor. Sorry, this is for 0638. Okay. Not for 0636 or 0637. Okay, thank you. Dockets number 0636 and 0637 will be referred to the Committee on Planning, Development, and Transportation. Mr. Clerk, would you please read dockets number 0638 and 0639? Docket number 0638, message in order for the confirmation of the appointment of Ann Kilgus as a member of the Bay Village Historic District Commission for a term expiring April 1st, 2026. And docket number 0639. Message in order for the confirmation of the appointment of Sanam Kumahia as a member of the Boston Landmarks Commission for a term expiring June 30th, 2025. Thank you, Mr. Clerk. The chair recognizes Councillor Durkin, the chair of Planning, Development, and Transportation. Thank you so much. Um, we went uh, for 0638 and 0639. We went through um, at last meeting the marathon of appointments. Um, these two individuals are highly qualified and they both appeared before the committee and Kilgis um, is this is a reappointment to the Bay Village Historic District Commission she's incredibly qualified and appeared before the Planning Development and Transportation Committee and then um, Senem Kumia um, is incredibly qualified a first-generation American has lived in Boston his entire life lives in Dorchester has an incredible amount of um, experience in the real estate um, community and he's appointed both to the Boston Landmarks Commission and to the Bay Village Historic District Commission. Um, he needs to be appointed to the Boston Landmarks Commission before I pull from the green sheets his Bay Village appointment. So I would move um, my colleagues like I um, asked for last meeting if we can suspend and pass these two appointments who both appeared before the committee and then when we get to green sheets I will pull the other appointment for Senum. Um, these were just done in the wrong order and um, so I apologize to my colleagues and hope that we'll suspend and pass these both today. Thank you so much. Thank you, Councillor Durkin. The Chair of Planning, Development, and Transportation seeks suspension and passage of dockets numbers 0638 and 0639. All those in favor say aye. aye. All opposed say nay. The ayes have it. These dockets have passed. 
Mr. Clerk, would you please read dockets number 0640 and 0641. Docket number 0640, message and order for the confirmation of the appointment of Angela Ward Hyatt as a member of the Highland Park Architectural Conservation District Commission for a term expiring June 30th, 2025. And docket number 0641, message and order for the confirmation of the appointment of Samaya Turner as a member of the Zoning Board of Appeal for a term expiring May 1st, 2026. Thank you. Dockets number 0640 and 0641 will be referred to the Committee on Planning, Development, and Transportation. Mr. Clerk, would you please read docket number 0642? Docket number 0642, message and order for your approval a home rule petition to the General Court entitled Petition for a Special Law, an Act Relative to Property Tax Classification in the City of Boston, filed in the Office of the City Clerk on April 1st, 2024. Thank you. Docket number 0642 will be referred to the Committee on Government Operations. We are now on to reports of public officers and others. Mr. Clerk, would you please read dockets number 0643 and 0644. Docket number 0643, notice or receive from the Mayor the appointment of Michael Woodall as Chair of the Boston Water and Sewer Commission for a term expiring January 3rd, 2028. And docket number 0644, notice or receive from the Mayor the appointment of Scott Finn as Comptroller City Auditor, effective April 1st, 2024. Thank you. Dockets number 0643 and 0644 will be placed on file. We are now on to reports of committees. Mr. Clerk, would you please read docket number 0381? Docket number 0381, the Committee on Education, to which was referred on February 28, 2024. Docket number 0381, message and order authorizing the City of Boston to accept and expend the amount of $500,000 in the form of a grant for the Open Data Curriculum awarded by the Mass Department of Education to be administered by the Department of Innovation and Technology submits a report recommending that the order ought to pass. Thank you. The chair recognizes the chair of the Committee on Education, Council Santana. Council Santana, you have the floor. Thank you. Thank you, Madam President. Um, the Committee on Education held a public hearing on docket number 0381 on Friday, March 29, 2024. The committee received letters of absence from Councilor Fernandez Anderson and Breeden, with Councilor Breeden also expressing support of the proposed curriculum program. The committee heard from representatives from the administration, Santiago Garces, Chief Information Officer for the City of Boston, and Kerry Jordan, Chief of Staff for the Department of Innovation and Technology, often called Do It, as my colleagues know. Chief Garces discussed the city's um, current open data portal, Analyze Boston, which provides the which provides the public with numerous data sets that are collected from various city departments. Do it and Boston Public Schools are exploring the possibility of incorporating an open data curriculum with current required civic and mathematics courses by utilizing this readily available data. These classes will be targeted towards high school students with the potential to expand this program to younger students in the future. These funds will be used to assist Do it and BPS teachers in designing a curriculum using Analyze Boston. DUE is also working with an organization, Data Science for Everyone, which introduces data science in, ele in elementary to high school classrooms to help shape the open data curriculum. This grant will also assist in funding a project manager to implement this program. The administration also shared that the curriculum itself will also be open source for use by any schools and educators. They're open, to, um, they're open to gathering feedback and expect that different educators beyond BPS will adapt and experiment with the curriculum that DUE publishes. Chief Garces discussed the importance of youth, youth learning data science as a way to enter the field of data analytics and computer science. He also highlighted the um, under, under representation of people of color and women in these fields, which typically leads to high income jobs. The committee also discussed tracking students' career trajectories and creating more pathways to data science and computer science higher education, other partnerships between DUE and BPS, and the possibility of providing professional development opportunities for BPS teachers. And I'll just add that I'm personally very excited about the new program that this grant would fund. In addition to teaching practical skills for a variety of careers, I think it's a great way to encourage civic engagement by our students. 
My own civic engagement journey has sparked while I was in school and led me to where I am today, so I'm excited by the opportunity to ignite that for students now. Using real-world data will provide students with the opportunity to learn about Boston and investigate community issues, which is a great way to get more involved. As the chair of the Committee on Education, I recommend moving the, the listed docket from the committee to the full council for discussion and formal action. At that time, my recommendation um, to the full council will be that this matter ought to be passed. Thank you. Thank you, Councilor Santana. Council Santana, the chair of the Committee on Education, seeks acceptance of the committee report and passage of docket number 0381. All those in favor say aye. aye. All opposed say nay. Thank you. The committee report on docket number 0381 has passed. We are now on to matters recently heard for possible action. Mr. Clerk, please read docket number 0509. Docket number 0509, order for a hearing to review programming available for seniors in the city of Boston. The chair recognizes the chair of the Committee on Strong Women, Families, and Communities, Councilor Murphy. You have the floor. Thank you. I'm just rising to say we had a great hearing and the conversation will continue because we all agree that we need to ensure that our seniors have a wide range of programming available to them across the city. So this will stay in committee, but I do think um, the lead sponsors would like to say more. Thank you. Thank you. The chair recognizes Councilor Weber. Councilor Weber, you have the floor. Uh, thank you, Madam President, uh, and thank you to the uh, Chair, Aaron Murphy. Uh, it was, a, it was a, a, a great hearing on Monday. Uh, I'd like to thank uh, uh, both Chair Murphy and my 11 colleagues for attending the hearing on Monday, uh, which I sponsored with Councilors uh, Pepin and, and Madam President Louis Jen. Um, I also want to thank the Eight Strong Commissioner, uh, Emily Shea, Chief Masso, uh, the Director of Events and Programs, Taisha Jones Horner and the program manager, Allison Freeman, for attending the hearing in person, as well as uh, Ray Santos from Ethos and Barbara, Barbara uh, Critchlow for attending um, uh, virtually. We held the hearing to determine the status of senior programming across the city of Boston and to determine what impact the state budget 9C cuts to programming will have on our seniors. While the city is operating two standalone senior centers in Brighton and East Boston, as Commissioner Shea testified, the need is much greater. In fact, a pop-up senior center at the Elks Lodge in West Roxbury run by Ethos has served more seniors than expected and provided senior programming to folks from all across the city. The folks attending the Ethos program and the senior program run by Ms. Critchlow on Mildred Avenue in Mattapan demonstrates that our seniors need more programming all the way from chair yoga to help with funeral and estate planning. I know the city is doing all it can to address the needs of our seniors, but the hearing demonstrated the need for us to continue to push to ensure that we are providing the kind of programming that will allow our seniors to age in place, stay part of the communities they help build, and to allow them to be active members of our city. Uh, th thank you, Madam President. Thank you, Council Weber, and thank you as a co-sponsor. I want to say thank you for your leadership. Um... Thank you, Council Weber, and thank you for uh, uh, leading on this issue. I know it matters to your residents in West Roxbury. But um, and, and chair yoga is amazing. Um, and I think uh, all of our colleagues showed up because of how important um, it is, uh, making sure that we take care of our seniors. So thank you for allowing me to co-sponsor. and Thank you for your leadership on this issue, not only for your district, but as we talk about this for our entire city. Uh, the chair recognizes Councilor Fernandez Anderson. Councilor Fernandez Anderson, you have the floor. Uh, thank you, Madam President. Um, I attended this hearing just uh, in interest in collecting information to uh, gather for the resolution that I filed, similar uh, but uh, specific to District 7. Um, from the hearing, um, I learned that there is a study going on. I know that Councillor uh, Lara and myself worked on um, ma making amendments to create the study. I'm very uh, thankful to um, Emily Shea, uh, the, our commissioner, to um, now executing it. So looking forward to the study just to properly uh, return to the chamber and asking my colleagues for support if there is, in fact, um, I can prove the need through the study. Thank you so much. Thank you, Councilor Fernand Janison. The chair recognizes Councilor Flynn. Councilor Flynn, you have the floor. Thank you, Madam Chair, and thank you to the sponsors of this important hearing. I also listen closely and want to thank the sponsors for highlighting the critical services that seniors rely on in Boston, whether it's food access, transportation, public health-related issues as well. 
I also want to ensure that in my district, especially seniors from Chinatown, um, also have equal access to these services as well in potentially having a center for seniors. We don't have one in this neighborhood, and it's a neighborhood predominantly of immigrants, and language and communication access would be part of that proposal. So hope, hope I can work with my colleagues in the city administration to ensure that the residents of Chinatown also benefit from this potential study. Um, thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you. Docket number 0509 will remain in committee. Mr. Clerk, would you please read docket number 0136? Docket number 0136, message note authorizing the city of Boston to accept and expend the amount of $700,000 in the form of a grant for the Commercial Acquisition Assistance Program awarded by the Barr Foundation to be administered by the Mayor's Office of Economic Opportunity and Inclusion. The grant will fund core support to its Office of Economic Opportunity and Inclusion to grow its impact. Thank you. The chair recognizes the chair of the Committee on Small Business and Professional Licensure, licensure Councilor Orell. Councilor Orell, you have the floor. Uh, thank you, Madam President. Uh, the Committee on Small Business and Professional Licensure held a public hearing on docket number 0136 on Monday, April 1st. Uh, the Committee heard from representatives from the administration, included um, Shigan Idowu, Chief of Economic Opportunity and Inclusion, and Donald Wright, Deputy Chief of Economic Opportunity and Inclusion. I was joined by my colleagues, Council Flynn, Council Weber, Council Mejia, and Council Durkin. I also received a letter of absence from Council Fernandez Anderson. Uh, Chief Idowu presented the Commercial Acquisition Assistance uh, Program, also known as CAP, a forgivable loan initiative aiding small business owners in acquiring commercial properties. CAP aims to mitigate risk for lenders, facilitating, facilitating access to traditional bank financing, and enable businesses to build a capital stack for property acquisition. The program targets Boston businesses combating gentrification by ensuring affordable spaces and fostering wealth generation through ownership. Uh, Deputy Chief Wright detailed how this 700,000 grant from the Barr Foundation will be used to help study and build CAP which will hopefully be a multi-million dollar fund offering forgivable 15-year loans of up to $250,000 to el eligible businesses. Uh, CAP will allocate this grant as follows, $400,000 for staffing, including a program director for application oversight and community outreach, $100,000 uh, for legal and technical assistance, and $200,000 for a business study um, and forming program imp implementation economic equity goals. Uh, CAP recipients uh, must submit annual impact reports and maintain affordable rents for 15 years. Um, as chair of the Committee on Small Business and Professional Licensure, I recommend that this um, document or fund ought to pass. Thank you. Council Orell, the chair of the Committee on Small Business and Professional Licensure, seeks acceptance of the committee report and passage of docket number 0136. All those in favor say aye. Aye. All opposed say nay. Thank you. The committee report on docket number 0136. 36 has passed. <clears throat> Mr. Clerk, would you please read docket number 0179? Docket number 0179, order for a hearing to discuss trash, trash collection in Boston. Thank you. The chair recognizes Councilor Pepin, the chair of the Committee on City Services Innovation Technology. Councilor Pepin, you have the floor. Thank you, Madam President. Yesterday, the City Services and Innovation Technology Committee held a hearing on this docket sponsored by Councilors Durkin, Coletta, and Louis Jen. We were also met by our fellow colleagues, Councillor Flynn, Murphy, Fitzgerald, Braden, Weber, Anderson, and Councillor Santana. We had a productive conversation with panelists from the administration on different research they are doing for trash collection, contracts, and materials for a more efficient process. Our public testimony brought community members across the city explaining the need for further review as a capital waste service contract is expiring in June 2024. We look forward to, a more, to more conversations during budget hearings on new methods, and I recommend this docket will remain in committee. The chair recognizes Councilor Mejia. Councilor Mejia, you have the floor. Thank you, Madam President. Just for the record, I want to state that I was also in that hearing. Thank you. Thank you. The committee report on docket number 0179. Uh, thank you. The committee report on 0179, the docket number 0179 shall remain in committee. 
Mr. Clerk, will you please read docket number 0198? Docket number 0198, order for a hearing regarding technological infrastructure improvements across city departments. Thank you. The chair recognizes the chair of the committee on, on city, innovation, city services and innovation technology, Councilor Pepin. Councilor Pepin, you have the floor. Thank you, Madam President. Also yesterday, the City Services and Innovation Technology Committee held a hearing on this docket sponsored by Councilors Coletta, Flynn, and Braden. We're also joined by our colleagues, Councilor Murphy, Louis Jen, Anderson, Braden, Mejia, Fitzgerald, and Councilor Durkin. We had Chief of Inform Information Officer Santiago Garces and Chief of Staff Kerry Jordan of the Department of Innovation Technology to give an update on their current work mapping the parking signs throughout the city, as well as plans for future tech updates. The counselors present engaged in a great conversation for tech upgrades, not only in the remote online services for our residents, but also within city halls as well. This, this document will remain in committee and open to conversation. Thank you. The chair recognizes Councilor Coletta. Councilor Coletta, you have the floor. Thank you so much, uh, Madam President, and thank you to the chair, my co-sponsors, Councilor Flynn and Councilor Braden for their work and all my colleagues for joining. Um, as mentioned by the chair, we heard from our chief info officer, Sandy Garces, and Carrie Jordan, who we all know well. This was a continuation of a conversation uh, that we first had in October of last year in an amalgamation of two separate dockets. One, broadly speaking, about the technological infrastructure of our city, but then also the digitization of parking regulations in the city. And it sounds like Boston, based on the conversation yesterday, Boston is progressing in, um, in terms of its uh, technological infrastructure to carry out uh, basic city services effectively and efficiently to ultimately serve the residents of Boston. The, te uh, the technology program, softwares and system that we use as a city and in departments are the backbone of everything we do here. Updating everything we use to break down collaboration um, and communication silos and barriers to communicate to our residents is a top priority, but it does require significant investment and staff capacity. We learned yesterday that due to additional budget resources that we secured in last year's, uh, last year's budget, we've been able to contract out important projects that make our city run better and add uh, four new positions to do it. Um, some of the more um, more namely or, or important projects that we've um, embarked on is auditing all 300,000 of our assets in the public realm, understanding all of the parking regulations in the city of Boston and categorizing them. We had no idea and we didn't have a full audit of, of what was even on our streets. We had to rely on Google Maps, which is um, fine, but not good if we want to run a, a city effectively. Um, ensuring systems like Cobux, which tracks street permits are actually working and speaking across departments and with utility companies. And so we should be reviewing an assessment from Do It Shortly. And so I look forward to, to getting that and sending it out to my colleagues and continuing this conversation because it is so important to the health and vitality of our city. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Coletta. The chair recognizes Councillor Flynn. Councillor Flynn, you have the floor. Thank you, Madam Chair, and thank you. I'm honored to join my co sponsors for this important hearing. I also had the opportunity during this hearing to ask Do It if they would include ensuring that our school buses, especially our buses that transport BPS student athletes to their practice, to their game, or to their after school program, um, arrive on time and pick up our students when they're supposed to be picked up on. Uh, this is an issue I'm going to focus on during the budget process, but with the great technology we have across Boston, there should be no reason why we can't ensure every student athlete gets to their game, gets to their practice, knowing where the bus is, and um, there should be zero mistakes going forward, knowing that we have the best technology in the world. So that's the, that's the issue I'm going to focus on, but again, I want to say thank you to the uh, sponsors and honored to join with you today. Thank you. Thank you. Docket number 0198 will remain in committee. And Councilor Pepin, I know you had a double header yesterday with two hearings. Um, and as a new council, you really handled it well. So thank you for, for, for holding those hearings yesterday. We are now on to motions, orders, and resolutions. Mr. Clerk, would you please read docket number 0645? Docket number 0645. Councilor Mejia offer the following. An ordinance establishing the Office of Inspector General within the City of Boston. Thank you. The Chair recognizes Councilor Mejia. You have the floor. 
Uh, thank you, Madam President. And I just want to uh, know, uh, Councilor Ben, there was one of those hearings that I wasn't at, so I just want to clear that up. For the record, you know, attendance <laughs> is under the microscope here, and I want to make sure that I get credit for when I show up. Um, for those who are Catch listening. Yeah, yeah, I yeah. do. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you. Um, so I am, first, before I even um, start off, I want to um, add Councillor Worrell and Councillor Anderson as original co-sponsors. Councillor Worrell is added as an original co-sponsor. Uh, Councillor Mejia seeks suspension of the rules to add Councillor Fernandez Anderson as an original third co-sponsor. Seeing and hearing no ob objections, Councillor Fernandez Anderson is so added. Councillor Mejia, you have the floor. Uh, thank you, Madam President. Um, so let me just set the stage. Um, I think that we, have an amazing opportunity to really look at what we need to do to really restore trust in city government. We, when we look around the national landscape, when we look around things that are happening even in our own backyard, there seems to be a common theme is that people do not trust government to function in the ways that it was intended to. And um, given the number of opportunities that we've had to show up as a body and really fight for our constituents. This is just another uh, pathway towards that. Um, Boston's, um, Bostonians deserve a city government that is grounded in transparency and accountability um, here to the city of Boston. Um, one of the reasons why I established the Committee on Government Accountability and Transparency was because having been on the outside fighting and trying to have a voice and a role in the decision-making process. I've seen that time and time and time and time again, people have always felt that things are being done to them without them. And I want to really highlight that this ordinance is uh, really shepherding the work that our council colleague, our previous council colleague, um, Councilor Campbell, brought to the table in 2019. Um, in light of some of the issues that had bubbled up into the top with some corruption and some bribes that were happening here in the city of Boston. But that wasn't the reason why she filed it. She filed it because what she really wanted to do is create a mechanism in which people really felt like government was listening to them and responding to their needs. There isn't no real formal process in place that gives people an opportunity to file a complaint, not just around um, city services, but also city councilors. We're all elected to represent the people, and we're all accountable to the people that we represent. And this gives us an opportunity to hold ourselves to a standard in which people know that we're listening to them. We've come into this chamber to host hearings, and oftentimes no one shows up to those hearings. And we have subpoena par powers to do so, but we never really ex exercise that power. And I think that when we're thinking about um, waste, when we're thinking about overseeing um, different departments and um, opportunities for us to figure out what we can do differently, this, this particular office will give us some more insight. Right now, in my office, I've decided to audit four pieces of legislation. Um, the residential, uh, retail residential kitchens ordinance, the Black Men's Commission, um, the Fair Chance Act, and the language access ordinance that we passed. What good is policy if we're not able to audit how efficient it is? And so my hope is, is that we have a mechanism in place in which provides us an opportunity to really look at what we could do differently, to look at how can we look at the complaints that we get from folks. We're looking at the BPDA process. We're looking at folks that come to our office who have had issues with zoning. Councilor, um, the district councilor from District 5, um, and I had a constituent who was having a hard time navigating the permitting process in the city of Boston. There was really no other vehicle for this individual to come to but to come to us. But if there was an, a formal process in place, they would have a, a direct contact with a, with a department that can help them understand whether or not we are serving the people. Um, so my hope is, and I want to be really clear, this is a conversation. This is, a, this is the beginning of what I hope would be a good process in which we can develop for ourselves as a council a piece of legislation that really gives people an opportunity and, and, and a voice and a platform to really hold government accountable. 
Now, I know that when this was filed, um, Councillor Campbell, I'm not sure what her, operation, her aspirations were for running for, for a higher office, but I was incredibly in awe that regardless of whether or not she was going to be mayor one day, she decided to put forth a piece of legislation that would hold even her accountable to the people. And I just want to uplift that um, because people have a hard time with accountability. We talk about wanting to be transparent. And when we have an opportunity to do that, we turn the eye. And I'm hoping that my colleagues will see that our, um, our residents want us to do better when it comes to being transparent and accountable to them. Because ultimately, they're the ones that pay our salary, and they should have a vehicle in which they can hold us accountable. We're also looking at the most important piece of this is really about restoring trust. And I think that this gives us an opportunity to do just that. We're also looking at um, procurement. We have an opportunity to really look at whether or not uh, folks are getting a piece of that pie, as we've been talking about for so long here on the council. This gives us an opportunity to really be able to dive deeper into it. Um, this also, this piece of legislation includes having an oversight advisory committee, which will unpack a little bit further throughout the working sessions. But my hope is, is that we'll be able to have an independent voice um, and any structure for us to really be able to move things through. Now, what I do know is that politics have a way of creeping into um, policy making. And so my hope is, is that we'll be able to file a hearing in a timely fashion, and we'll be able to really unpack um, the credibility of, of establishing uh, this particular piece of legislation, and that we'll be able to host working sessions, and the administration will show up, and that we'll be able to, as a body, for once, you know, here, be able to demonstrate that we can work with the administration, that we can work with community, and that we can actually deliver on, on what it looks like when we're all rowing in the same direction, and we're all giving um, the people that we serve a seat at the table. Thank you. Thank you. The chair recognizes Councillor Worrell. Councillor Worrell, you have the floor. Uh, thank you, Madam President. And I'd like to thank Councillor Mejia uh, for her leadership in, in introducing this ordinance and for adding me as an original co-sponsor. Um, this initiative mirrors uh, successful models uh, implemented in other cities across the United States, including Chicago, uh, New York, Philly, Atlanta, uh, several of which work highly effective uh, collaboration with their state level counterparts. Um, and it also builds off um, the work started by my predecessor, District 4 City Councilor, and now Attorney General, uh, Andrea Campbell. Uh, underscoring its potential uh, effectiveness in enhancing transparency and efficiency in government processes, um, this office will have robust investigative powers, including subpoena authority, um, and the duty to report illegal acts. Uh, the Inspector General in this ordinance um, is empowered to root out waste, fraud, abuse, and uphold the highest standards of ethical conduct. Uh, this ordinance, um, as Council Mejia has um, alluded to and spoke about, builds off the Council's work uh, five years ago to ensure a strong commitment to promoting honesty, integrity, and transparency in Boston City government and will set a precedent for responsible fiscal management and public trust. So I'm looking forward to creating an independent and well-funded um, office. Thank you. Thank you. The chair recognizes Councilor Fernandez Anderson. Councilor Fernandez Anderson, you have the floor. Uh, thank you, Madam President, and thank you uh, to my colleague, uh, the original uh, sponsor, for adding me. Um, I think there are different conversations already in community as well, uh, maybe with councilors. Um, I had uh, been working on an ordinance to put a, together a citizen's assembly. Um, there's an advisory council in my district. We've talked about CAB. We talked about different uh, ways of creating um, structured uh, mechanisms or accountability bodies to, act, to, to um, hold um, us and uh, city departments accountable. I think that um, I'm really, really excited to look into this conversation um, through a hearing and talk about exactly what it could look like. This is ex exceptionally thorough. Um, so very interested in giving you um, my input as well as hearing from community. I think since we're talking about in the spirit of accountability and coming from community or accountability, then let's, um, sorry, transparency and accountability, then let's uh, allow community to weigh in in terms of what, the, how this should be structured, right? So that it's, um, 
so, so, so that we are actually um, exemplifying what it's supposed to be about. Um, thank you so much, and I look forward to the work. Thank you. The chair recognizes Councillor Coletta. Councillor Coletta, you have the floor. Thank you so much, Madam President. I want to thank um, the original co-sponsor. I typically withhold comments on uh, uh, government operations dockets, but I just want to express general support for this. Um, I'm happy to see the resurrection and refile of this docket from 2019, originally written by um, Attorney General Andrea Campbell. Um, that was born out of, as you mentioned, multiple scandals that plagued the BPDA and, and the ZBA. And um, having a municipal level inspector general in addition to the state level is a good thing due to the fact that uh, the state level IG never investigated the incidents that happened in City Hall. And uh, how we funded those investigations um, was that we had to outsource private and expensive lawyers to help pay for those investigations. And so it was not fiscally responsible of us to, um, to outsource the services when we could have them in-house. Um, and those reports were never independent and they were never public. And so generally I support this. I look forward to the conversations and figuring out what the best model is and um, always wanting to make sure to give credit where credit is due to my friend and our Attorney General, Andre Campbell. Thank you. Thank you. The Chair recognizes Councilor Flynn. You have the floor. Thank you, Madam Chair, and I just want to thank the sponsor for her thoughtful wording and the important message that she's relaying here today. And also wanted to highlight what Councillor Worrell has mentioned, that several other cities across the country do have it, including New York, including Philadelphia, and Lexington, Kentucky, I believe. Um, maybe we also can learn from them on how they went about doing it and maybe get some lessons learned, what went well and what were some of the challenges. But I, I think it's an excellent idea. And uh, please add my name. Thank you. Thank you. The chair recognizes Councilman here. You have the floor. Uh, and uh, thank you, Madam President. I just want to thank my colleagues um, and really want to bring in the spirit of uh, Councilor, former Councilor Campbell. She and I had a really good conversation. Um, and I watched the tape the day that she introduced this, and I got to hear from um, my colleague, Councillor Janie and Councillor Edwards, who stood up in, in, in support. And I was really struck um, by the level of, of just, like, I don't know what you call it, just workmanship in, in, in that. And, and even when Councillor Baker had rose up, he, he talked about some of the concerns that he had. And it was just such a beautiful thing to see that even though not everyone was on board, but that people were able to really lean into something and really not make it about themselves and really make it about what this moment means to those that they were representing at the time. And so I'm really encouraged by what I've heard so far from my colleagues. And ultimately, I think that if we continue to lead in this way, I think that those who put us in these seats are going to really believe that we are working all in collaboration and in true partnership and in true spirit of holding ourselves um, accountable to those that we serve. So I just want to say thank you, uh, uh, especially thank you to Councillor Campbell for writing such a strong piece of legislation um, that we were able to resuscitate the same way that we did with the Black Men's Commission that was under uh, former Tito Jackson's um, leadership. And so this, if we can get this to the finish line, it'll be two pieces of legislation that our office was able to champion because my predecessors had had the audacity to bring those things to the table. So thank you. Is anyone else looking to speak on this matter? Would anyone else like to add their name? Mr. Clerk, will you please add Councilors Braden, Coletta, Durkin, Fitzgerald, Flynn, Murphy, Pepin, Santana, Weber, please add the chair. Docket number 0645 will be referred to the Committee on Government Operations. Mr. Clerk, would you please read docket number 0646? Docket number 0646, Councilor Pepin offered the following. A petition for a special law an age waiver for the maximum age requirement for Max Anderson to join the Boston Police Department. Thank you. The chair recognizes Councilor Pepin. You have the floor. Thank you, Madam President. Um, can I also add Council President Louis Jen as an original co-sponsor? Councilor Pepin, seek suspension of the rules. Add Councilor uh, Louis Jen as an original third co-sponsor. Seeing and hearing no objections, Councilor Louis Jen is so added. Councilor Pepin, you have the floor. Thank you, Madam President. Um, the individual who would like to in hand, is, his name is Max Henderson, and he handed me a letter that he wanted me to read on behalf of him. He says, 
He arrived to, he's, he's of age 44, living in Hyde Park, where he has been living for the past eight years. He's currently a manager at Road to Responsibility, a group home setting where he takes care of residents with disabilities. He's been working there for the past five years, and he's been a realtor before that. He moved to the United States in 2010 from Haiti. It was a tough immigration process for him, but luckily he was able to gain entry and now has become a U.S. citizen. And, el and now he's eligible to apply to become a Boston police officer. He became a U.S. citizen in 2019, but due to some difficulties in his personal life, he was not confident that he was able to make it through the training process at the time. Now he's in a better, better state, physically, mentally, and in excellent health to become a police officer to protect and serve his community. He took the written exam on Monday, March 18th, and he strongly believes and he is confident that he will pass. But he was devastated when he heard that he had to be younger than 40 years old in order to become a Boston police officer. He's writing this letter to the city council to ask for a favor, to have an age waiver that will allow me to be appointed to the Boston Police, Off Boston police Department in the incoming class of June 2024. Thank you for your understanding and consideration and asking the city council to please help him achieve become a police officer so that he can serve his community and the city he calls home now. Um, for my colleagues, this is, this is my third home rule petition that I've called for, um, for age waivers, which is why later in the agenda, you will see that myself and Councilor Coletta and Councilor Santana are pushing for an increase in that age max because there's a lot of individuals in this, in, in this city that are healthy, they're well experienced, they're great citizens, that they just want to serve our community as a police officer. And that's why I'm asking for your support in this document. Um, in this document. Thank you. Thank you, Councilor Pepin. Councilor Pepin, am I a second co-sponsor? Is there a third co-sponsor? There There's no third co-sponsor. Okay, sorry. Jai, um, just to correct the record, just adding myself as original co-sponsor. Um, and no need for suspension of the rules. Thank you, Councilor Pepin, for bringing this forward. Thank you for adding me as an original co-sponsor. Uh, we do bring a lot of these to the council, Max. Um, Henderson is more than capable and would love uh, to see him be able to join the force and I want to thank you for filing this um, and hope to be able to get this through and, and, and put this up to Beacon Hill. Is anyone else looking to speak on this matter? Would anyone else like to add their name? Mr. Clerk, please add Councilors Braden, uh, Durkin, Fernand Anderson, Fitzgerald, Flynn, Mejia, Murphy, Santana, Weber, Worrell. Uh, this docket will be referred to the Committee on Government Operations. Mr. Clerk, would you please read docket number 0647? Docket number 0647, Councilor Mejia for the following. Order for a hearing on diversifying cannabis business models. Thank you. The Chair recognizes Councilor Mejia. Councilor, you have the floor. Thank you, Madam President. This is just a refile. You know, a lot of the work that we've been doing here in the city, um, we often talk about creating more access and more equity and more opportunities for cannabis um, and folks who are trying to get into that industry, but we always fall short. Um, and I think that what we're trying to do with this hearing order is really look at all of the different ways um, in which folks who are looking to enter the industry can do so, that it doesn't begin and end with opening up a shop. Um, I, I'm looking at uh, ways that we can explore uh, our retail residential kitchens ordinance that we filed um, in past and looking at ways that maybe we can use this as a way to uh, open up uh, a cannabis kind of Commonwealth kitchen model in which folks can have the opportunity to test out uh, some products and then sell it to some of the local shops that are in and around the neighborhood. So I know there's a lot of regulations that come around with cannabis, so I'm nowhere thinking that with this hearing we're going to make it all happen, but I do think that it warrants a conversation in terms of making sure that the city is doing everything in their power to give folks who are trying to enter the cannabis industry the tools and the supports that they need and that we're thinking outside of the box and that we're pushing ourselves to um, look at our protocols, policies, and procedures to make sure that we can meet the moment. Thank you. Thank you. The chair recognizes Councillor Durkin. Councillor Durkin, you have the floor. Councillor Mejia, thank you so much for this. Um, it is so important. Um, I have been watching um, over many years um, the promises of equity in the cannabis industry and just seeing that they fall flat. We've lost the ball here. Um, local operators are not able to operate in our city. Um, na nationwide chains are completely taking over. Um, and 
Um, I think there was, uh, you know, a move at the state house. There was a move locally um, to promote equity in cannabis, and it completely failed. And so, thank you so much for this conversation. I'm so excited to take part. Um, and just adding, um, a lot of cannabis dispensaries who have gotten their initial approvals in my district are caught up in litigation after litigation. Local people who want to start a business in this city are being told. Here's the, you know, basically, here's this national thing, they get the go ahead. Here's this local thing, you're getting sued by all your nearby abutters. So we have a lot to work on, and um, I will just signal uh, my support for the end of the buffer zone. This is incredibly important, and, Councillor, I want to work with you on this. Thank you so much. Thank you, Councillor Durkin. The chair recognizes Councillor Mejia. Yeah. Madam President, thank you. Uh, Councilor Durkin, you want to be added as a original co-sponsor? Well, then you shall be added. <laughs> thank you, Councilor Durkin is added as an original co-sponsor. Is anyone else looking to speak on this matter? Would anyone else like to add their name? Mr. Clerk, please add Councilors Braden, Coletta, Fitzgerald, Flynn, Murphy, Fabian, Santana, Weber, Worrell. Docket number 0647 will be referred to the Committee on Small Business and Professional Licensure. Mr. Clerk, would you please read docket number 0648. Docket number 0648, Councilor Flynn offered the following. Order for a hearing to discuss pedestrian safety, traffic calming, and expanding the safety surge program in the city of Boston. The chair recognizes Councilor Flynn. Councilor Flynn, you have the floor. Thank you, Madam Chair. Madam Chair, may I suspend rule 12 and add Councilor Fitzgerald and Councilor Santana as an original co-sponsors? Councilor Fitzgerald is added as an original co-sponsor. Councilor Flynn to suspension of the rules to add Councilor Santana as an original third co-sponsor. Seeing and hearing no objections, Councilor Santana is so added. Councilor Flynn, you have the floor. Thank you, Madam Chair. This is a hearing to discuss measures that would improve pedestrian safety, traffic calming, <coughs> and the possibility of expanding the safe surge program in Boston. Last week, a four-year-old child, Gracie, was fatally struck on Sleeper Street and Congress Street in the Four Point neighborhood. This week, on Tuesday, a pedestrian was struck and killed on Frontage Road. There are now four pedestrian deaths in Boston so far this year, with seven pedestrian fatalities last year. These tragedies remind us of the work that must be done to realize Vision Zero which is the goal of having zero serious and fatal traffic crashes. And we have, other, we have had other similar tragedies like this in the past. In 2018, we lost a beautiful young boy, Colin, after being struck by a car on L Street in South Boston. Following that tragic crash, I recommended a 12-point pedestrian safety plan for South Boston and to the city, which featured traffic calming infrastructure like speed humps, raised crosswalks, rapid flash beacons with pedestrian islands in the middle of the road, curb extensions, among others. Pedestrian safety has long been a top priority for the city council and I. In 2018, I called for and held a hearing with Councilor Baker to advocate for reducing the speed limit to 20 miles per hour in our residential neighborhoods. And now we see many of those 20 mile per hour signs with our speed hump zones up now. In 2019, I called for and held a city council hearing on concurrent traffic signals as I continue to believe it is a recipe for disaster to have cars and pedestrians in conflict due to right turn green arrow and a pedestrian walk sign at the same time. Just as, just as an example on concurrent jurisdiction for the vehicle and for the pedestrian, that basically means that the pedestrian can cross in the crosswalk and at the same time the vehicle can make a turn on that same crosswalk. It's many cases throughout the city, and I could name you a half dozen in and around my neighborhood, 
or just on the corner of Melcher Street and Summer Street. If you're on Summer Street heading into South Boston and you're taking a right onto Melcher Street driving, you would be able to take a right driving and with the green light and at the same time the pedestrian would be able to cross also at the same time. At a public community meeting on Friday down at the Fort Point Neighborhood Association and with residents of, of South Boston and Fort Point and with city officials present, I highlighted this issue and asked that we revisit allowing both the pedestrian in the vehicle to both have the right of way at the same time. I'm still calling for that again. We need to implement that immediately and give the pedestrian the right of way, give the pedestrian the opportunity to cross the street in the crosswalk at a safe time. And then the automobile can drive taking taking the turn but both of them can't do it only one or the other at the same time and it needs to be the pedestrian not sure why we still have this in our city i have asked many times in writing and in community meetings to change this policy again i'm asking for this policy to be changed in 2020 after a handful of car crashes into buildings or light poles in one week in South Boston, I called for and held a hearing again with Councilor Baker on declaring speeding cars a public health emergency. In 2021, after the passage of the federal bipartisan infrastructure bill, I called for a, por a portion of whatever funding the city would receive to be dedicated to address long-standing pedestrian safety needs with improved traffic calming infrastructure. I continue to believe that pedestrian safety is one of the most critical issues we face in the City of Boston. In 2023, the City of Boston implemented the Safety Surge Program, where the City installed zones of speed humps on eligible neighborhood streets to make our streets safer for our pedestrians. They include the 20 miles per hour zone we also adv advocated for previously. However, currently the speed hump program is only being installed on smaller side streets, but not on wider streets and busier streets where cars and commuters are consistently speeding and serious crashes also occur. As it relates to that, I would like to see the speed miles per hour be reduced even further in Boston. 25 miles an hour is excessive driving through a neighborhood, a dense neighborhood in Boston. I think it should be 20 miles an hour. I even think it should be 15 miles an hour. But driving 25 miles an hour in residential streets is unhealthy. It's unsafe. Our neighborhood main streets, commercial roads, high traffic corridors, bus routes are often dangerous for pedestrians to cross and should also have traffic calming infrastructure in place to force speeding vehicles to slow down. Many residents have advocated for speed humps, raised crosswalks in these areas, and we should consider whether safe surge programs should be updated with infrastructure to be installed on high traffic roads to ensure road safety for all. Finally, a gentleman right behind me, John Provenzano, is advocating for this new technology other cities have where if a car is speeding, say 40 miles an hour, this electronic device would automatically reduce that speeding car down to the appropriate speed uh, speed limit, whether it's 25 or 25, 20 miles an hour. Other cities across the country have experimented with it. Maybe it's time for Boston to experiment it, experiment with it as well. So I hope that we can use this hearing to discuss how we can work together, enhancing traffic calming measures 
ensuring safer streets and sidewalks, how we expand our existing plan for traffic calming infrastructure. Thank you. Thank you, Council Flynn. The Chair recognizes Council Fitzgerald. You have the floor. Thank you, Madam President. Um, on hearing this news, and, and thank you to, to the maker and, and honor me to be a co-sponsor as well, um, especially the news of the four-year-old child. I think of my own four-year-old child, and that's, that's worst nightmare scenario stuff. It's something that goes through your head constantly as a parent, uh, as not even when you're just downtown, but when you're in your own neighborhoods as well. Um, and the worst part about it is they're so preventable. Right? Uh, if the driver pays attention, gets off his cell phone, isn't texting and driving, if there's, if there's daylighting of areas, there's proper signage and proper enforcement, all these things are preventable. And that's what makes the, the incident from last night and one from last week uh, that much more infuriating. Um, everywhere I go in the district, the most diverse district in the entire city, everywhere I go, no matter where it is, people are asking for these speed humps. And uh, it, I agree, uh, but I do think that the administration should work with the city councilors uh, in at least giving a list of the 15 biggest perpetrators of speeding in, in each district uh, to, and, and, and prioritize those because us in the neighborhood know on the ground what the worst streets are. Um, and so I continue to push for that uh, as I have been because I think even it, it would touch every community, uh, it would, we'd work with the council to identify them and we take care of the main perpetrators and at least everyone would feel touched to know that at least, okay, it might be a while now before they come back around and do the rest of the streets, but at least they can, they can begin. Um, uh, the problem here is enforcement. I think about the technology hearing that we just had yesterday, uh, chaired by uh, Councillor Pepin, and uh, thinking about that role and how this happens. I know, uh, you know, I'm no fan of Big Brother, but there's got to be a way because we can't recruit as many police as we need to do traffic enforcement. Uh, there's got to be technology that can take that place. Uh, I'm losing faith in the drivers of Boston and in the visitors that drive into Boston. Um, and so uh, there's got to be a measure taken, unfortunately, to counteract that. Uh, but again, it's about being proactive. We can't be reactive here and wait till an incident occurs to go and make a change. Um, and uh, through the years, I know folks on this body ha have uh, made those changes. So I, uh, I look forward to continuing to push those changes till we make a, a completely safe uh, traffic for our city. Thank you. Thank you. The chair recognizes Councilor Santana. Councilor Santana, you have the floor. Thank you, Madam President. <clears throat> thank you, Madam President. I want to first thank Councilor Flynn for your leadership on this and including me as a co-sponsor. Um, as Councillor Flynn noted, and just a matter, and, and Councillor Fitzgerald as well, um, in just a matter of days, we've had two tragic reminders of the danger, uh, dangerous pedestrians face on our streets, just in District 2 alone. Um, the death of a young girl who was just four years old, as well as the death of a man who was a wheelchair user, are sad and senseless reminders that the safety of our streets must be our priority, and that our most vulnerable street users are often the most at risk. And this is certainly not a problem only for downtown neighborhoods. Eight pedestrians were killed by drivers in Boston in 2023, including Rosendale, High Park, and Dorchester. These deaths may call extra attention to this issue, but we also must not accept the dangerous and often life-altering injuries caused by our drivers. Boston's Vision Zero data reports 588 crashes involving pedestrians last year, along with 391 crashes involving um, bicyclists and over 2,500 crashes last year in Boston involving a motor vehicle. Sometimes accidents do happen, and certainly responsible driving is critical. But too often, crashes and, and the resulting injuries are the result of policy decisions. Street designs can reduce crashes. Expanding um, sight lights and intersections, known as daylighting, can make pedestrians more visible. Speed humps, race crosswalks, and changes to street layout can, show, can slow down drivers from speeding or blowing through intersections. Protected lanes with actual physical barriers can create truly safe space for, commuter, for commuters using bikes and other micro-mobility devices to safely get where they're going while keeping pedestrians safe too. Traffic signals phasing can eliminate conflicts between cars and pedestrians. Boston's first center running bus lanes on Columbus Avenue have shown street design can make more drivers obey the speed limit, improve pedestrian safety with safer crossings, and, ca and make car, car access to parking easier and safer, while also reducing transit times for bus riders. And if we can get the state legislature to allow it, automated enforcement of red lights, stop signs, bus lanes, and illegal turns could help our streets function safer and as intended. 
The city is making progress on some of these initiatives, but we can do more and we must find the right balance between temporary quick fixes and ensuring we put permanent, durable and self-enforcing safe street designs in place. None of this is about forcing anyone to commute a certain way. It's about ensuring that our, all of our streets and all of our users are safe, no matter how you decide to get around. I look forward to working together with my co-sponsor and my colleagues to ensure that Boston lives up to the standard, to the stated mission of, sorry, to the stated mission of Vision Zero Boston to eliminate fatal and serious crashes. Thank you, Madam President. Thank you. The chair recognizes Councillor Pepin. Councillor Pepin, you have the floor. Thank you, Madam President. I um, just want to start by giving my condolences to both those families that lost a loved one. Um, I think it's important for us to remember that those are residents of Boston that we've lost. Um, and as Councillor Fitzgerald mentioned, as a father of, of a three-year-old, I cannot imagine what those parents are, are, are experiencing. Um, so I commend Councillor Flynn for bringing this to the table. I wish I could have been added as a fourth co-sponsor if that was a thing. Um, but it reminds me of my own hearing order calling for a safe school zone um, plan because in my district, um, we're home to one of the, those four fatalities that you mentioned. Um, one of them being in Bexley, on in the intersection of Bexley Road and Washington Street in Rosendale. Um, a few weeks ago, a pedestrian was killed by, by, by a driver in the nighttime. And just a year ago, unfortunately, another four-year-old was hit, was killed by a driver on Wood Ave in High Park. Um, and when you think about that is, like Councillor Fitzgerald mentioned, these are preventable accidents. Um, but as a city, we need to take accountability for the lack of infrastructure that, ex that does not exist um, in the city. Everyone has mentioned it. It's better crosswalks, sp raised crosswalks, stop signs, the bump outs, better enforcement. We don't even have to go too far to look at a city that I think does a good job at this. Um, Providence, Rhode Island does a fine job of using their traffic lights cameras for enforcement where they ticket speeders and violators of red lights. So I want to push our state le legislator to consider that and make it possible for us here in Boston to do that. Because I think what's happening here is it's, it's too much for, this, for the city of Boston. Um, so I just want to say that I want to work with you, Councillor Flint, to make this happen, to work with the administration, the Boston Transportation Department to, to make sure that we, we are creating a safe environment for all residents in the city of Boston. That's what we deserve. Thank you. Thank you. The chair recognizes Councillor Murphy. You have the floor. Thank you. Madam President, um, and thank you, Councillor Flynn, for bringing this forward. Um, an important issue, and I did think of your stop sign pin when you did your maiden speech, and I know the will is here on this council to make changes. I got three calls just this week, one um, about, two about speed humps, and as we know with Waze and other apps we use, what were once quiet side streets are now cut-throughs where cars are speeding and where kids used to be able to play you know, safely on the sidewalk, across the street to a neighbor. Now parents aren't able to do that anymore, and that's a quality of life issue. Also got a call and have had several calls about the intersection right near my house at the top of Councilor Fitzgerald Street, um, at Oakton Ave and Adam Street, where we have the library, we have the Kenny School twice a day with that traffic, where the neighbors there are very concerned that is it going to take a fatality or a bad accident for things to change? So looking forward to this hearing, I know that we need to include the police also because at community meetings across the city, there's the balance between the police having the ability to ticket the offenders but not wanting to over ticket. And so we definitely need to have them part of the conversation. But also the answer that I have to often give to people that I know is frustrating is you'll be put on a list maybe soon they'll get to it so i do think that this hearing hopefully will push the administration and the departments who can make change um, have it happen quicker thank you thank you the chair recognizes councilman here you have the floor you have you have the floor councilman here okay thank you madam president um i just want to rise and thank councillor flynn as i was looking through the tape um in preparation for filing the inspector general's uh ordinance 
it was the same, you, that same, you were there talking about pedestrian safety. You actually introduced, you know, a hearing around that. And I just want to say thank you because consistency, right, in terms of the issues that you're fighting for, it's great to see that you keep on it and how important it is for us to have people in office that are going to fight for the things that we all deeply care about. But it was just such a coincidence that the same day that Councillor Campbell filed that and I filed this, you, it's, it goes to show that the work still needs to, we, we need to right now, um, you know, I, I see the central bus lane discussions, I see all of the things that deal with uh, bike lanes and everything, and I think that this is an opportunity for us to add um, pedestrian safety lanes to the conversation too. I think that this is how people feel like we're really listening to them. So I look forward to participating in the hearing and lending my voice and my advocacy to you both, um, to the three sponsors of this, um, to make sure that you know we get to the we get to where we need to be. Thank you for your leadership. Thank you. The chair recognizes Councilor Weber. You have the floor. Thank you, Madam President. Um, you know, uh, I, I thank you to Councilor Flynn for, for bringing this in the co-sponsors. Uh, and it's, a, it's just a terrible thing that, uh, you know, it took two recent fatalities and the, the death of a four-year-old for this, uh, you know, for us to have to deal with this. Um, just, uh, you know, traffic safety, uh, speed humps, that's, I hear probably more about those issues in District 6 than any other. Um, but I, I'd just like to highlight some data. Um, you know, uh, these accidents, it's not inevitable as a result of the, the cars we have or the cell phones. Um, you know, from, from 1990 to 2020 in Europe, uh, uh, pedestrian fatalities went down by nearly 80%. In the last 10 years, uh, pedestrian fatalities in the U.S. have gone up by 25%. Um, another study showed that for every mile that uh, you know, uh, somebody in the United States walks as a pedestrian, uh, compared to someone in England, the, the American pedestrian is six times more likely to be killed by a vehicle. Um, you know, this should not be happening. It's a countrywide issue, and it's something that we should be doing a lot better job here in Boston. And I think as our European uh, brothers and sisters have shown, you know, you can, this is a problem that we can solve. So I look forward to working on it with my fellow counselors. Thank you. Thank you. The chair recognizes Councilor Fernandez Anderson. You have the floor. You have the floor. Sorry. Uh, thank you, Madam President. I'd like to um, thank uh, first Councilor uh, Flynn for filing this. Such an important issue, um, extremely important in my district as well. Um, but I really wanted to take the time and say that um, uh, to, for us to um, thank our mayor for prioritizing this issue. This is this is actually one of like the very top on her agendas, and we've seen that throughout the city. Um, as I c we continue transportation um, plans in District 7, I know that um, also thanking uh, Chief Yasha Franklin Hodge um, to uh, just just making sure that this is a priority, but also um, doing the best that he can with the capacity that he has while he's trying to increase capacity so that he can uh, uh, develop or put these speed humps in places and address all of uh, our sidewalk issues. Um, I know that um, our council president yesterday uh, mentioned this in terms of how uh, this is one particular department that will prioritize the work and come out and do walking tours and sort of like studies and uh, actually work with counselors to do this work. So I think this conversation is super important and it's going to be one that's going to be um, robust and productive uh, considering that our mayor and the transportation department definitely prioritize the safety for um, our citizens. Thank you. Thank you, Councilor Fernandez Anderson. The chair recognizes Councilor Durkin. Councilor Durkin, you have the floor. Thank you so much, and thank you to Councilor Flynn for sponsoring this. Um, I think I'd be remiss if in this conversation we didn't also mention the shortage of engineers in the city and all of the open jobs in, you know, in particularly the Boston Transportation Department. Um, and also um, adding the um, the amount of the people that make the speed humps, there's a limited uh, capacity there. And so just adding, um, this is such an important conversation. In my district, we're having a conversation around Terrace, Parker, and Gurney streets and Mission Hill and how to reconfigure and reformulate those streets to meet the needs of, of uh, 
street that's being developed. And I think um, I also would be remiss if we didn't mention um, the opportunities that we have within our role as city councilors in the development process to ensure that we use the mitigation from projects um, and in our districts to ensure that we get those public way improvements and we get um, and we get um, increased pedestrian uh, safety through development. And um, and I'm really um, wanted to also build on Councilor Tanya Fernandez Anderson point about our um, Boston Transportation Department because what I see I have a, um, a meeting with them really frequently and uh, that had pr been set up by my predecessor Kenzie Bach who cared a lot about these issues and um, so we have this reoccurring meeting and just the talent that we have working within the Boston Transportation Department I'm really honored to work alongside them and excited for the conversation um, and also excited to you know really drill down um, in the five neighborhoods that I have about where safety improvements can be made um, and also into the data like um, Councillor Weber said um, because a lot of those incidences are available publicly so prioritizing improvements in the district and also excited to work with Councillor Flynn um, uh, particularly on an intersection at Dartmouth Street which is in his district but a lot of my constituents use so really grateful to the advocates and um, and all the councillors for being interested in this issue as well thank you thank you the chair recognizes Councillor Braden Councillor Braden you have the floor Thank you, Madam President, and thank you to Councillor Flynn for leading on this issue yet again. You've been very, very dogged in, your, in re elevating this issue over many, many years. Uh, I'd like to follow on on a comment from Councillor Durkin's comments. In, in District 9, many of our public realm and pedestrian safety improvements are tied to development, and that's all well and good. We're delighted to have extra money to put in to uh, improve pedestrian safety, but if that project stalls or is delayed, that means we're sitting for 10 years waiting for pedestrian improvements to happen uh, in, in, in the parts of the neighbourhood because the developer hasn't got to it and built this project. So, you know, it's wonderful that we're getting that money, but if it's waiting for a certificate of occupancy or a, a per issuing of a permit and that process is delayed, then that definitely stalls the whole process for us. So, you know, I think we have to find other ways of um, not being so reliant on um, development money uh, or having some sort of a, a pipeline or some sort of a mechanism where uh, we don't have to delay the improvements until the projects are, are moved on forward. Um, the other thing we have to deal with in Alston Brighton, I'm sure Dorchester has the same issue, uh, is cut through traffic. Uh, maybe all of our districts have this problem. Cut through pra pra traffic due to ways. Uh, we have many, we have hunt, probably thousands, tens of thousands of cars come through our neighbourhood at a very fast clip every day to avoid going uh, on the Massachusetts Pike, which is usually a parking lot from 7 o'clock to 9 o'clock every morning. Um, and they, uh, they cut through the, the cut through our neighbourhoods and residential neighbourhoods and we see uh, near misses, pedestrian, uh, pedestrian accidents. And you know we've had some fatalities over the last few years, and it's just so sad. And it is—it's a preventable event. It may be seen as an accident, but I really, in this context, there's no such thing as an accident. We can do so much more to prevent this. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Braden. Um, I want to thank Councillor Flynn and the co-sponsors for filing. Um, Councillor Flynn uplifted the names of Gracie, recently passed, Colin. So many of my colleagues uplifted those who have passed, adults um, and children. Councillor Pepin talked about Wood Avenue. Um, it's a street that I drive on every day. And ever since the fatality last year, I haven't been able to drive on the street and past his mom's house without feeling tremendous sadness. And I just want to lift Yvonne Pierre um, into this space as a four-year-old that was um, struck and killed in High Park. And I think many of you have said it, no parent should have to bury their child. Um, if there's anything that should drive policy changes when parents have to bury their young kids. And a um, few things have changed and struck me as much as the funeral of Yvonne Pierre, um, because a four-year-old dying should not, should not happen in our streets. So um, I want to thank all of my colleagues, and hopefully we can um, get some movement. I know the mayor, the mayor was also at the funeral, and I know it was deeply, deeply affected. And so, 
Um, I hope that we can get some traction on this issue. Is anyone else looking to speak on this matter? Would anyone else like to add their name? Mr. Clerk, please add Councilors Braden, Coletta, Durkin, Fernand Anderson, Mejia, Murphy, Pethan, Weber, Worrell, please add the chair. Docket number 0648 will refer to the Committee on Planning, Development, and Transportation. Mr. Clerk, please read docket number 0649. Docket number 0649, Council Fernandez Anderson offer the following. Order for a hearing to discuss and establish City Council roles and responsibilities and ways to implement metrics to hold members accountable. Thank you. The Chair recognizes Councilor Fernandez Anderson. You have the floor. Uh, thank you, Madam President. I'd like to actually uh, withdraw this filing. I think that Council Mejia's um, filing on uh, the docket 0645 um, actually already encompassed a lot of these points and uh, would actually do the same thing. So I don't want us to be redundant. I think I will follow um, her lead in being a co-sponsor um, in the conversation. Hopefully we're getting the same um, objectives uh, taken care of in the hearing uh, under Council Mahir's um, filing. Thank you. Thank you. Docket number 0649 has been withdrawn. Mr. Clerk, please read docket number 0650. Docket number 0650, Councilors Pepin and Coletta offer the following. Order for a hearing to raise the age requirement for entrance to the Boston Police Academy. Thank you. The Chair recognizes Councilor Pepin. Councilor Pepin, you have the floor. Thank you, Madam President. And for the record, may I also add Councillor Santana as a third co-sponsor? Councillor Pepin seeks suspension of the rules um, to add Councillor Santana as a third original co-sponsor. Seeing and hearing no objections, Councillor Santana so added. Councillor Pepin, you have the floor. Thank you, Madam President. Um, as mentioned earlier, in my first three months in office, I've already filed for three homework petitions to, to help someone um, with their age waiver to become a police officer. Increasing the age maximum from 39 years old to 45 and adopting a more inclusive approach to becoming a police officer in Boston holds significant importance in shaping law enforcement agency that reflects the diverse needs and values of the community it serves. By expanding the age limit, the police department can tap into a broader pool of potential recruits, including individuals who may have pursued alternative career path or gained valuable life experiences before considering law enforcement. This can lead to a more mature and well-rounded police force, better equipped to handle the multifaceted challenges of modern policing with empathy, wisdom, and cultural competence. Just in my first three months in office, I have filed three homework petitions to assist local residents over the age of 39 to become police officers. Mr. O'Brien, who was previously part of the EMS. Mr. Guzman, who worked for Boston Housing Authority for over a decade. And now Mr. Henderson, a proud Hyde Park resident who currently works for Road to Responsibility. All three outstanding citizens who are very qualified, who simply had difficulty applying to become a police officers because of their age. By increasing the age maximum to 45 years of age, the police department can attract a more diverse array of candidates, enriching the organization with a variety of perspectives, languages, and cultural competencies. A police force that reflects the demographics of the city it serves and not only enhances trust and cooperation within communities, but also improves the effectiveness of policing efforts by promoting greater understanding and empathy among officers and residents alike. Raising the age maximum is an essential step toward building a more equitable, resilient, and community-oriented police force in Boston. Thank you. Thank you. The chair recognizes Councilor Coletta. Councilor Coletta, you have the floor. Thank you so much, Madam President. I want to thank um, the, uh, my co-sponsors for their leadership on this. Um, the Boston City Council has filed multiple home rule petitions to waive the maximum age requirement uh, to Boston residents. State level regulations um, uh, set the max at 32 years, um, uh, 32 years old. And then under Councilor Flaherty's leadership in 2007, he increased that to, to 40. And that occurred after a hearing and then a subsequent Home rule petition, so that is the goal here. But we wanted to bring in all stakeholders to, to talk through it. But um, our population's health is generally improving. We have better access to nutrition and health care um, and other factors. And so there's this whole pool of individuals who are willing and able to become uh, police officers. So we might as well simply give them a chance to, to even apply. Uh, we're not lowering the standards. Um, and all we're just hoping is, is to give them a, a pathway to take the test, um, both the written test and then the, the physical test. 
It is a crucial measure to help fill the personnel shortages that we see in, in the police department and just good government. When there are multiple special laws, they no longer become special, to put it in the most simple terms. And so why not just create a simple fix to what exists at the state? And I also think it's important to amend this system where those with access to this information to know, even know or, or file a special legislative docket, I think is, is privileged information. And so we want to expand that out to make it more um, accessible and, and equitable for everybody. So I look forward to the conversations on this and um, look forward to hearing from, from everybody about what our limitations might be, if there are any, but really just this is a, a, a well-intentioned docket um, and I'm proud to be a co-sponsor of it. Thank you. Thank you. The chair recognizes Councilor Santana. You have the floor. Thank you, Madam President, and thank you to Councilors Pepin and, and Coletta for including me as a co-sponsor and, and for your leadership. Um, my partners on this matter have covered much of what I, uh, I wanted to say, um, so I will just emphasize one point briefly. We are constantly short on police officers in Boston. It's a demanding and difficult job, and it's one that often goes with too few thanks for a job well done serving our community. And yet, despite our need for more police officers, we often hear cases of people who have fought hard to overcome obstacles to pursue the dream of serving Boston's public safety as police officers, only to be stopped by an arbitrary age limit for the police academy. We heard an example of this just today in the case of Max Henderson, who immigrated from Haiti, moved to Boston, and worked for years to become a citizen and pursue becoming a police officer. The police academy and police department have rigorous requirements. There's no reason to block applicants who can meet those criteria just because they've celebrated some extra birthdays. The wisdom earned through um, diverse lived experiences, first careers, and time invested in community and family before entering the police academy can all benefit our police force. To meet the public safety needs of our city, we should embrace and celebrate these applicants, not shun them. I look forward to hearing on this mat. I look forward to the hearing on this matter, so we can collaborate to create a path for dedicated individuals to serve our city as police officers. Thank you. Thank you, Councilor Santana. Is anyone else looking to speak on this matter? Would anyone else like to add their name? Mr. Clerk, please add Councilors Braden, Fitzgerald, Flynn, Murphy, Weber, Worrell. Please add the chair. Uh, please also add Councilor Durkin. Thank you. Docket number 0650 will be referred to the Committee on Public Safety and Criminal Justice. Mr. Clerk, please. Oh, oh, and please add Councilor Mejia's name as well. Okay. Thank you. Uh, docket number 0650 will be referred to the Committee on Public Safety and Criminal Justice. Mr. Clerk, please read docket number 0651. Docket number 0651. Councilor Murphy for the following. Order for a hearing to discuss the need that all our youngest children in the universal pre-kindergarten program are receiving their special education services. Thank you. The chair recognizes Council Murphy. Council, you have the floor. Thank you, Council President. Um, as I think many of our hearing orders that we file come from calls we get from concerned constituents, and I've gotten a few calls um, from parents and teachers who are providing this wonderful opportunity. As many of us know, we have a new program in the city of Austin, the Universal Pre-Kindergarten, the UPK. This program is funded by the city of Austin, and it promises to deliver on high-quality choices that are free of cost to Boston's three- and four-year-olds. Anyone um, who has entered the BPS system knows that we call our three-year-old program K-0. Our four-year-old program is K-1, and then K-2 is open to all children, which is kin kindergarten. So the Boston UPK increases the number of seats, which we know we have never had enough seats for our three- and four-year-olds in the BPS system. And it is a community-based providers that are offering up to 992 seats. These are at community um, centers and other places across the city. This encompasses an additional 2,556 K-1 seats in BPS for our four-year-olds without disabilities and 880 K-0 and K-1 seats for our three- and four-year-olds that do have special needs. 
As many of you know, I was a special education teacher, a K-1 teacher for many years, so I taught our special education students. If you are identified um, as having a special need and your family already has you enrolled in the early intervention program, on the day of your third birthday, you are guaranteed a seat in BPS in a K-0 classroom. And for many students, they would be taking that seat. So some of our students who are entering into these UPK seats are maybe already identified. That's something I do want to get more information on. But what is happening that children who aren't identified prior to this are in a school setting, the teachers and others are noticing some delays and they're requesting testing and then needing to find special education <coughs> teachers to provide these services for our students. So I do want to have this conversation to make sure that we are providing the special education services, but at the same time, we have Krista McSwain in the UPK program at this hearing so we can make sure, especially as always we talk about heading into budget season, that we're supporting that program to make sure that they have the resources necessary so that no child is left without services and no parent is told that, sorry, we don't have a place in a BPS school and we can't provide services to your child. So hoping that we'll have some good conversations and we'll have some action coming out of that. So looking forward to the hearing. Thank you. The chair recognizes Council Weber. You have the floor. No, you did not. One moment. One moment. I'll put your mic on. Sorry, I meant to suspend Rule 12 at first, and I want to add Councillor Braden and Councillor Weber as original co-sponsors. Councillor Braden and as, is added as an original co-sponsor. Councillor Murphy seeks suspension of the rules and addition of Councillor Weber as an original third co-sponsor. Seeing and hearing no objections, Councillor uh, Councillor Weber is so added. Thank Councillor you. Murphy, you have the floor. Oh, no. Okay. No. Awesome. Just Council Weber, you have the floor. Uh, th thank you, and, and, and thank you to Council Murphy for bringing this up. Um, you know, I, uh, <clears throat> having recently visited Horizons for the Homeless, and uh, you know, in Jackson Square, um, you know, it's, it's incredibly important that we provide pre-K services uh, for everyone across the city, um, and I think we need to do everything we can to ensure that that program is fully implemented. I have some personal experience with the topic of, of, of your filing. Um, uh, when my, my son was in fourth grade, he was diagnosed with autism, and he was struggling in math, uh, but he was denied uh, an IEP at his school. And it was incredible to me that, you know, despite the need for services, that there were these sort of bureaucratic headwinds that, you know, would, would be pushing back on us. And, um, you know, I, I, I vowed to make sure that, you know, any, any family that needs special services in, in our city would, would get it. Um, he, he, uh, BPS is definitely atoned, and he's getting the services he needs now, and he's thriving. And I, I thank all of his uh, teachers and, and providers uh, uh, now. But um, just to have gone through that process and seen you know, the pushback uh, is something that I need to, you know, we need to make sure that, you know, our, our young families here in Boston are supported. So thank, thank you, Council Member. Thank you, Council Member. The Chair recognizes Councilor Braden. You have the floor. Thank you, Madam President, and thank you, Councilor Murphy, uh, for adding me to this uh, docket. Um, I worked for 16 years at Parkland School for the Blind as a physical therapist, and, um, you know, I used to specialize in care of the elderly, and then all of a sudden, bang, I was working with, uh, with uh, little kids, and um, due to a quirky um, a change in the Medicare uh, funding uh, in 1997. Um, so I, I really feel very strongly that we need to identify our student, our young, let's call them children, children who have special needs, uh, identifying identification early. Uh, when they're when they're infants and and shortly thereafter to try and identify the children who need support, so that they can uh, hit their milestones or support them to reach their milestones, uh, and uh, identify uh, their uh, impairments or the needs early on because the brain is evolving, it's growing, uh, and that's the moment. So uh, it's really, really important that, uh, first of all, we have early identification of those children who are in the zero to three years old so that they get their early intervention and, uh, and that their parents are supported to uh, help them. 
but then also thereafter uh, in the transition to uh, into uh, UPK or into school, it's make sure that uh, those those students, uh, if they are if they if they first of all identify them, but if they're uh, and also to support them so that they develop the readiness skills so that when they come into a regular classroom, we're talking about inclusion all across the board in in, in our BPS system. Um, those readiness skills are critically important so that when those young uh, children. Uh, come to a classroom with their peers, m many, many ch other children, that they've got the skills um, and the support to succeed uh, and have the readiness skills so that they can be uh, active participants in their class and that they, uh, that they are successfully um, uh, included in, in their classroom. So I think this is a really timely uh, conversation to have because it's, it's a critical piece of the conversation we're having about inclusion as well. So thank you, Councillor Murphy and Councillor Weber, for including me. Thank you. The Chair recognizes Councillor Mejia. You have the floor. Yeah. Um, thank you, Madam President. I just want to thank my colleagues. Um, yes, education is my thing, and I'm really excited that we're going to be able to pack it, unpack it here. Um, you know, as, as I often talk about the fact that I started a nonprofit organization called C Plan um, many years ago to create space for parents to really have a voice at the table. And what we learned through that process is that oftentimes parents were being redirected to so many different spaces and places just to get services. And unless you have access to wealth and knowledge and, and information, your kids were going to end up in situations that they didn't need to be in. So I think that this is both a, an opportunity for accountability, right, and for us to really recognize where are the gaps and how we can stand in those gaps. Um, and what are the checks and balances that exist when, when BPS forces parents, right, to um, play the going down the rabbit hole to see uh, you get what you get and you don't get upset. And so I think that this is an opportunity for us to really get real around issues of, of education and special education in particular. But when it comes to the most foundational part, it's the early stages of our children and making sure that we have early detection. Um, because nothing hurts more than being, being not knowing what you could have done differently to support your child. So I really do applaud the sponsors for bringing this to the table. And as with everything else, I'm really hoping that we are going to seize this moment to really take a hard look on what we need to do differently in Boston Public Schools because I'm not feeling this whole idea of just passing a budget and you know just passing things through just for the sake of getting a win. I think that the people that are watching deserve for us to be um, accountable to the parents. Thank you. Thank you. Is anyone else looking to speak on this matter? Would anyone like to add their name? Mr. Clerk, please add Councillors Coletta, Durkin, Fitzgerald, Flynn, Mejia, Pepin, Santana, Worrell. Please add the chair. Docket number 0651 will be referred to the Committee on Education. Mr. Clerk, would you please read docket number 0652? Docket number 0652, Council Lujan and Santana offer the following. Resolution recognizing April as Fair Housing Month. Thank you. The um, chair recognizes uh, Council President Louis Jen. Thank you, Vice President. Um, and I would like to add Council Santana as an original co-sponsor. And I'd like to suspend the rules to add Council Weber as, uh, as an original third co-sponsor. Uh, seeing no objection, Councillor Santana and Councillor Weber is added as original co-sponsors. Councillor uh, President Louis Jen, the floor is yours. Thank you. The, um, April is Fair Fair Housing Month. Uh, the Civil Rights Act of 1968, also known as the Fair Housing Act, was signed into law by President Lyndon Johnson on April 11, 1968. This legislation was significant um, because of the expansion of earlier civil rights acts, specifically addressing discrimination in the sale, rental, and financing of housing based on race, religion, national origin, sex, handicap, and family status. Um, tomorrow we'll be commemorating uh, a very solemn day, uh, which, was, which on tomorrow, April 4, 1968, uh, Dr. Martin Luther King was assassinated. And that was one week prior to this act. Dr. King had been fighting specifically for equal rights in housing. Um, and after he was killed, President Johnson encouraged Congress to pass the law quickly as a way to honor Dr. King's work in life and also making him a central figure in the legislation's history. I want to honor Dr. King and the work that he did 
in housing and in all areas. Um, what was for the sanitation workers and tomorrow as we commemorate um, his assassination, we also must recognize the work that he has left undone even as those try to peel back the work of progress. The act's enactment was also driven by the broader social context of the time, including the disproportionate impact of the Vietnam War casualties on African American and Latino families who often came home from war and faced housing discrimination. Advocacy by organizations and legislators utilized bipartisan support from senators like our very own Edward Brooke and our very own Edward Kennedy, who played crucial roles in overcoming congressional resistance. To celebrate the first anniversary of the law, and from then on, April was named for Housing Month. Um, I filed this resolution each year to remind us all of the idea that everyone has an equal chance to live where they want. Oftentimes, people face housing discrimination and barriers in placing their vouchers or in barriers um, in, in trying to find a place to live because of um, their gender identity or because of their race. Uh, and we've seen here in the city of Boston through practices of blockbusting, through practices of redlining, uh, where government and private uh, market work together uh, to, to really prevent communities from look, living together. I look at Mattapan, Dorchester, Roxbury, and the history of those neighborhoods of Jewish community wanting to live aside black community, but private, commu private interests, along with government practices, really prevented that sort of inclusive living that we really strive for today. Um, and so those same actors, the government, together with builders, realtors, and advertisers, must spread uh, the message of fair housing far and wide. And I want to big up Bob Terrell in our own Office of Fair Housing and Equity for the work that he's doing in trying to really educate those around fair housing issues. Uh, the Fair Housing Act is a step towards making sure everyone has a fair chance at having a home, which is celebrated and promoted every year so that we keep improving housing equality. Um, myself and uh, one of my co-sponsors, Councilor uh, Santana, on April 8th are going to have a hearing um, on fair housing. And it's going to specifically allow the progress that we've made uh, in investing more in the Office of Fair Housing and Equity and the work that we still have to do. So I just want to thank my colleagues, uh, uh, Vice President. I am seeking suspension and pass for this. So thank you so much. And thank you again to my co-sponsors. Thank you. Uh, Council Santana, the floor is yours. Thank you, Chair. And <clears throat> thank you to, um, to the Council President, um, Louis Jean, for your leadership in offering this resolution and for including me as a co-sponsor. I believe that housing is a human right. The most basic step of living up to that vision is preventing direct discrimination against people when they're renting or buying a home, getting a mortgage, or seeking housing assistance. And, amazing, and amazingly, next week we'll celebrate just 56 years since the passage of this landmark civil rights legislation, which established in law this most basic idea, that people should be able to pursue a place to live without regard to their race color, national origin, sex, family status, religion, or disability. Not that anyone should have any special rights or access, just that the playing field should be level. The Fair, House, the Fair Housing Act is worthy of a celebration, but we certainly need to do more to ensure that ensure fair, house, fair protection exists for everyone. And here in Boston, we're fortunate to we're fortunate to have additional city and state laws in place, which extend protections against housing discrimination to include income source, including housing vouchers, as well as age, martial status, veteran or active military status, and genetic information. And our local laws also include explicit protections against discrimination based on, based on sexual orientation and gender identity, which is especially critical in this era when we see increasing legislative attacks against our LGBTQ, LGBTQ plus community, particularly our trans, non-binary, and gender expansive siblings, and when we've seen just how fragile our federal protections can be. But we know just but we know just having a law isn't enough. We have to enforce it too. And during Fair Housing Month, we remember that our fight for housing equity and justice is ongoing. Despite our laws, evidence continues to show that housing discrimination is a widespread problem, and we shouldn't have to accept that. This problem is made worse by our housing crisis. Having too few homes available means more competition, applying for apartments, making offers to homes, or finding affordable housing. 
And that means landlords, building managers, brokers, and owners can disregard applications for even the slightest reason, knowing someone else is always in the, in the right behind them. We've seen in the data how this plays out, with discrimination being more common, especially against our most vulnerable residents. Discrimination against housing choice voucher holders is particularly rampant. In fact, a 2020 Suffolk Law study found discrimination in 86% of tests with housing providers in Greater Boston. Everyone deserves a home, and everyone deserves, a fair, everyone deserves fair access when trying to find one. If you've been treated unfairly by a housing provider, you can get help. Contact the City of Boston, uh, the City of Boston Office of Fair Housing and Equity, or the Massachusetts Attorney General's Civil Rights Division, or the Massachusetts Commission Against Discrimination. They can help if you've been denied housing, charged a higher amount of rent or fees, or been harassed because of one of, th of the characteristics that are protected by our laws. Next Monday, the City Council will hold a hearing on illegal housing choice voucher discrimination and improving fair housing practices in Boston in a combination of a hearing ordered sponsored by myself in collaboration with Council President Nui Jen and Councilor Weber, as well as a hearing order sponsored by Council President Nui Jen in collaboration with Council Worrell and Breeden. I want to thank all my colleagues for your leadership and your continued dedication to ensuring all of our residents in Boston have a fair shot when trying to find a home. I ask my colleague, colleagues to join me in support of this resolution declaring April to be Fair House, Housing Month here in the City of Boston. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Councilor Weber, the floor is yours. Uh, thank you, uh, Councilor Burrell. Um, and uh, I just want to uh, thank uh, Madam President Louis Jen and, and Councilor Santana for, uh, for, for co-sponsoring co this. You know, uh, housing discrimination is just, it's an insidious practice that uh, never goes away, and it's something that you know we can do a better job at here in the city. You know, as Councilor Santana just highlighted, uh, the, even the law with the best intentions is not worth much if there's no enforcement. Uh, and so we have to make sure that uh, you know we enforce our rules and uh, do our best to combat you know uh, housing discrimination uh, based on race, having a housing voucher, or, or even you know, sexual orientation. We, we had Trans Visibility Day here uh, last week, and, and uh, I'd just like to highlight that uh, too often members of our trans community are discriminated against in seeking housing, and, and uh, you know, in addition to other groups, we have to make sure that they can secure housing here in our city. So, thank you. Thank you. Um, would anyone else like to speak? Uh, Council Braden, the floor is yours. Thank you, um, Mr. Chair. Um, thank you, Council President Louis Jean, for offering this. Fair housing resolution. I think uh, one of the other issues that we see in our city is not just access to fair access to the housing that we have, but also uh, the housing we build. We're, we do not build enough housing for families. Uh, we have. Uh, I've been. I've been at meetings where the developer will actually say, "We say, where are the amenities for families? Have you got a playground? Oh, we're not going to build. We're not building for families." Like, that's technically illegal. We should be mindfully, like, we're wondering why our, our enrollment in our schools is falling, why people are leaving the city. It's very, very difficult for families to stay in the city because of the cost of housing. And in, this, in the actual building of housing, there's in, there, there is discrimination in that process as well. So thankfully, uh, due to the leadership of uh, our colleague, uh, Councillor uh, Edwards and, uh, and the affirmatively and the affirmatively furthering fair housing is part of our zoning now. So developers cannot say that they're not going to build for families. But you know, I think we have to watch all the all the different aspects of this so that we can ensure that we're building enough enough housing for our families um, and and in, in non-traditional families families uh, so that they can uh, safely uh, live in the city and not be and not be displaced. Thank you. Anyone else looking to speak? I'll share a few words. Um, I just want to give a big shout out to Bob Tyrell and all his work. I'm also <coughs> just reminded of the book, The Color of Law, um, that outlines the history of um, housing discrimination. And also just a big shout out to Marvin Martin and the Action for Equity um, and their fight uh, for anti-displacement tools here in the city of Boston. 
Um, Council President Louis Jen and Council Santana Web. Oh. oh, would anyone like to add their name? Uh, please add Council Braden, Council Coletta, Council Durkin, Council Fernandez Anderson, Council Fitzgerald, Council Flynn, Council Mejia, Council Murphy, Council Pepin, Council Worrell. Uh, Council President Louis Jen, uh, Council Santana, and Council Weber seek suspension of the rules and passes the docket number 0652. All those in favor say aye. Aye. All those opposed say nay. Uh, thank you, docket number 0652 has been adopted. Thank you. Mr. Clerk, would you please read docket number 0653? Document number 0653, Council of Flynn, off of the following. Resolution in support of Senate 3452, Fred Hamilton Veterans Lost Records Act. Thank you. The chair recognizes Council Flynn. Council Flynn, you have the floor. Thank you, Madam Chair. Madam Chair, a veteran service and medical records are critical for that veteran to receive VA benefits. But some of our veterans have had their personal records lost through no fault of their own. In 1973, a horrific fire at the National Personnel Records Center in St. Louis destroyed the records of 16 million Army and Air Force veterans. After the fire, the VA established a process for those impacted, which allowed veterans whose records were lost to use the next closest medical record or a buddy statement to meet the burden of proof. This proposed federal legislation, S-3452, the Fred Hamilton Veterans Loss Record Act, would expand that process to all veterans whose records were lost by the VA or the Department of Defense. This bill would ensure that all veterans whose records were lost by the VA or the Department of Defense, through no fault of their own, can still receive their earned VA benefits. The bill's name refers to Fred Hamilton, an Air Force veteran who was exposed to toxic substances during his service in the Vietnam War. His military treatment record, along with many others, were lost through no fault of his own after being transmitted from the DOD to the VA when he retired from military service. Unfortunately, without these records, he cannot prove his health conditions are service-connected. Service-connected means that a particular veteran would receive compensation due to injuries sustained while on active duty. Our veterans who have served our country honorably, and they have earned these benefits, they should not be denied services or have to fight to prove their disabilities are service connected due to mistakes made by the VA and the DOD through no fault of their own. I hope we can suspend and pass this today and I also want to recognize members of the congressional delegation from Massachusetts who had the opportunity to meet in DC several weeks ago including Senator Warren, Senator Maki, Congresswoman Presley, and Congressman Lynch. And we didn't necessarily discuss this piece of legislation, but we discussed a lot of veterans related issues, especially issues impacting women veterans and homeless veterans as well. Again, I hope we can suspend and pass this today. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you. Is anyone else looking to speak on this matter? Would anyone else like to add their name? Mr. Clerk, please add Councilors Braden, Coletta, Durkin, Fernandez, Anderson, Fitzgerald, Mejia, Murphy, Pepin, Santana, Weber, Wall. Please add the chair. Councilor Flynn seeks suspension of the rules. Um, seeks suspension of the rules and passage of docket number 0653. All those in favor say aye. All opposed say nay. Thank you. Docket number 0653 has been adopted. Mr. Clerk, would you please read docket number 0654? Docket number 0654. Councilor Fernandez, Anderson, offer the following. Resolution recognizing Ernestina Tatina Silla as, and her role as a pioneering leader in the struggle for independence in Gennai Bissau. Thank you. The chair recognizes Councilor Fernandez Anderson. Councilor Fernandez Anderson, you have the floor. 
Uh, thank you, Madam President, and uh, thank you, Mr. Clark, for giving your best effort there. Um, Titina Sila, her name is Ernestina Titina Sila, um, was a fearless uh, spirit and unwavering commitment to liberation and gender equality in Guinea-Bissau. Um, ignited, really, a uh, fire within all of us. Um, I bring her today to the council um, to honor her because she is one of those uh, women who was a leader uh, within her own right um, and uh, really in the North Front during the Guinea-Bissau War against Portugal uh, for independence uh, echoes throughout history embodying the relentless pursuit of justice and empowerment for both Guinea-Bissau and Cabo Verde. Titina's legacy transcends her military prowess. She championed the rights of women um, within the PAIGC or PAIGC blazing a generations to follow. Uh, despite the tra tragedy of her untimely passing, Titina's memory or not passing but uh, being uh, uh, assassinated, Titina's memory burns uh, brightly, igniting the hearts of all who hear her story and inspiring them to fight for a better tomorrow. Um, with fervent admiration and deep respect for all that she did for uh, Cape Verde and Guinea-Bissau, I'm asking here today that we um, honor her, her extra extraordinary legacy um, as a beacon of hope and courage uh, for the struggle of freedom and equal gender equality for all women across the world. Um, she is one of my favorites, um, as you know, uh, next to um, Auntie Harriet, um, but in, is, is not often recognized and I don't think often gets the flowers that she deserves. Um, asking for a suspension pass here. Thank you. Thank you, Councilor Fernandez Anderson. Thank you for recognizing this for mother for the work that she did in Guinea Bissau and literally around um, the continent. Would anyone else like to speak on this matter? Would anyone else like to add their name? Mr. Clerk, please add Councilors Braden, Coletta, Durkin, Fitzgerald, Mejia, Murphy, Pepin, Santana, Weber, Worrell, please add the chair. Councilor Fernandez Anderson, suspension of the rules and adoption of docket number 0654. All those in favor say aye. All opposed say nay. Thank you, docket number 0654 has been adopted. We are now moving on to personnel orders. <coughs> Mr. Clerk, would you please read the personnel? Would you please read the personnel order? Docket number 0655, Council Lujan for Council Murphy, personnel order. The chair moves the passage of docket number 0655. All those in favor say aye. Aye. All opposed say nay. Thank you, the personnel order has passed. We are now moving on to green sheets. Is anyone looking to pull anything from the green sheets? The chair recognizes Council Durkin. Council Durkin, you have the floor. Hi, I'd like to pull um, 0534 from the green sheets. This is the appointment that I talked about earlier for the Bay Village Historic District Commission, um, San M. Kumia. Kumahia, sorry. What's the docket number one more time? 0534. And this is someone that we just appointed to the Landmarks Commission, so now they're eligible to, for the Bay Village Historic District Commission. Thank you, Mr. Clerk. Will you read it into the record? <clears throat> From the Committee on Planning, Development, and Transportation, docket number 0534, message in order for the confirmation of the appointment of Sanam Kumahia as a member of the Bay Village Historic District Commission for a term expiring June 30th, 2025. Thank you. I have um, another green sheet. Absent objection. Oh, uh, that matter is uh, properly before the body. We would you like to pull another matter from the green sheets? Yes, but I think we need to vote on this one first. Okay. Sorry. Yeah, it's, it's better if we do that. Okay. Um, so, Councillor Durkin, are you seeking for passage of docket number 06? 0634? Yes. 0, 5, 3. Okay, 05 of docket. Okay. Councillor uh, Durkin, the Chair of Planning, Development, and Transportation, is seeking passage of docket 0534. All those in favor say aye. Aye. All opposed say nay. Thank you, the ayes have it. This docket is passed. Oh, the, oh, this docket has been confirmed. Uh, Councilor Durkin, you have the floor. Okay, I'm looking, sorry. Oh, I'd like to pull 0505. 0505, docket number 0505. Mr. Clerk, would you please read docket number? If you need a minute to get it, I understand. Um, but once you have it, if you could read docket number 0505 into the record. 
From the Committee on Planning, Development, and Transportation, document number 0505. Message in order for your approval. In order approving the receipt of a preservation restriction on the Fowler Clark Farm, 487 Norfolk Street, Boston, Mass, 02126. The Fowler Clark Farm has historic significance to the city, and the owner, Fowler Clark LLC, has conveyed a historic preservation restriction on the exterior features of the buildings and site to Historic Boston Incorporated, a local charitable corporation. Thank you. Just to clarify, with those um, who have their, my colleagues who have their lights on, if you could just signal, is it on this docket or is it on another matter? It's on another matter. Thank you. Okay. Absent objection, the motion of the committee chair is accepted and the docket is properly before the body. Councilor Durkin, you have the floor. Thank you so much. Um, this uh, docket is very important to the preservation um, community and I'm really excited to that it is now properly before the body. I'd like to yield to the District City Councilor Enrique Pepin to speak to this. Thank you. The Chair recognizes Councilor Pepin. Councilor Pepin, you have the floor. Thank you, Councilor Durkin, and thank you, Madam President. Um, this, this is very important to my district. It is of great, um, it's great importance specifically for Mattapan because to approve the designation of, preser of preservation restriction on the Fowler Clock Farm on Nor Norfolk Street in Mattapan um, is a great opportunity to make history here. Um, this farm is the epitome of urban farming, teaching local residents the beauty of farming, but also serving as a community gathering space, exemplifying its rich history. The Fowler Clark Farm was built in the year 1786. It is older than 200 years old. And this is a very rare piece of land that you cannot find in many other parts of the city. So I'm asking my colleagues to please vote in favor of preserving this rich history in the heart of Mattapan. Thank you. The chair recognizes Councilor Durkin. Councilor Durkin, you have the floor. Thank you so much, Councilor Pepin. Um, as the chair of Planning, Development, and Transportation, I urge my colleagues to approve this docket 0505 today. Thank you so much. Thank you. The chair of uh, Planning, Development, and Transportation seeks uh, passage of docket number 0505. All those in favor say aye. aye. All those opposed say nay. The ayes have it. Docket number 0505 has been confirmed. Um, has passed. Has passed. Thank you. The chair recognizes Councilor Fernandez Anderson. Councilor Fernandez Anderson, you have the floor. Thank you, Madam President. Um, can we pull docket 0343? Of what committee? 0343. Of, of what, from what committee? Oh, sorry, arts and culture. Oh, okay. From arts and culture. We'll give the clerk a minute to, it's, it's docket 0303, Madam Chair? It's, yes. 0303. Thank you. 0343? 0343. 0343, yeah. Okay. You have it on the blue sheets? Yes. Docket number 0343. Yep. Just want to confirm everyone has it before them. Docket number 0343. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Clerk, will you please read it into the record? From the Committee on Arts, Culture, Entertainment, Tourism, and Special Events, docket number 0343. Message in order authorizing the City of Boston to accept and expend the amount of $325,000 in the form of a grant for the Red Sox Arts and Parks Program, awarded by the Boston Red Sox to be administered by the Mayor's Office. The grant will support art, arts programming, community events, and parks operations across Boston. Thank you. Absent objection, the motion of the committee chair is accepted and the docket is properly before the body. Councilor Fernandez Anderson, you have the floor. Uh, thank you, Madam President. As a chair of the Arts and Culture uh, Committee, um, I'd like to, uh, for my colleagues today, to or asking for passage of this docket, um, the community in Fenway uh, needs this uh, grant as soon as possible, emphasizing the need through um, examination of its allocation and proposing um, that it re uh, is uh, received suspended pass of, uh, today, as, I, as mentioned. Uh, this approach ensures that resources are distributed equitably and that critical funding decisions are made within careful consideration of their potential impact and most vulnerable uh, members of uh, this community. So uh, asking for my colleagues to suspend and pass to get this uh, funding allocated allocate as soon as possible. Thank you, Councilor Fernandez Anderson. Councilor, the Chair recognizes Councilor Durkin. Councilor Durkin, you have the floor. Thank you so much, Councilor Fernandez Anderson, for, um, for pushing for um, us to take this forward today. 
Um, despite the global recognition of the Red Sox team, our hometown team still has the greatest impact here in Boston. And um, this, the, this grant money um, is specifically for arts and culture, which I think is incredible um, to ensure that the neighbors around the ballpark sustain all the other elements of a thriving community, like access um, and, and these, uh, sorry, like opportunities for community connections and basically basic quality of life conditions. With the expansion of ballpark programming to a minimum of 12 concerts each year, it is important that the Red Sox remain a good neighbor by, among other things, providing these ongoing grants. I'm so happy to work with the Fenway community, with Councilor Tanya Fernandez Anderson in the Mayor's office to understand the best uses of these funds, and I hope my colleagues will support this necessary annual grant from the Red Sox. Thank you so much. Thank you, Councilor Fernandez Anderson, the Chair of Arts uh, um, Committee, seeks, suspension, uh, seeks for passage of docket number 0343. All those in favor say aye. aye. All opposed say nay. The ayes have it. Docket number 04, 0343 has passed. Is anyone else looking to pull anything from the green sheets? We are now moving on to late files. I've been informed by the clerk that there are two late file matters. No consent agenda. Uh, two personnel orders and four consent agendas. Uh, we will take a vote to add these matters to the agenda. All those in favor of adding the late file matter say aye. aye. All opposed say nay. Thank you, the late file matters have been added to the agenda. Mr. Clerk, please read the first late file matter into the record. First late file matter, personnel order for Council Lujan for Councilor Durkin. The chair moves for passage of this late file matter. All those in favor say aye. All opposed say nay, the personnel order has been adopted. Mr. Clerk, please read the next late file matter into the record. Second late filed matter for Council Lujan, for Councilor Dirk, and personnel order. The chair moves for passage of this late file matter. All those in favor say aye. All opposed say nay. Thank you. The ayes have it. This personnel order has been adopted. Mr. Clerk, please read the next late file matter into the record. Okay, there are four consent agenda matters uh, as late files. All those in favor say aye. aye. All opposed say nay. These late uh, file uh, consent agenda items have been adopted. We are now moving on to the consent agenda. Oh, we are now moving on to the consent agenda. I've been informed by the clerk that there are four additions to the consent agenda. Um, in addition to the ones that we have just uh, adopted, the question now comes on approval of the various matters contained within the consent agenda. All those in favor say aye. aye. Thank you, the consent agenda has been adopted. We are now on to announcements. Please remember these are for upcoming dates and events. And um, if you have any uh, events that you would like to announce, please do so here. If there's anyone that you would like to honor, we'll do that in the memoriam section. Um, I would like to honor uh, and say a uh, happy birthday to Larry Poston, the father of my chief of staff. Um, this Friday, we will have the Greek flag raising. Um, we will see our very own clerk there helping us um, to raise the flag. Uh, that will be at 1130 at City Hall Plaza. And then the parade, uh, the Greek parade is on Sunday. Mr. Clerk, starting at noon? At one. At one, beginning? At uh, Boylston Street near the public library. At the Boylston Street near the public library. So we, um, everyone is invited, please attend. There will also be a parade this Saturday. Uh, beginning at 2.30 at the Boston, at Boston Common for our, uh, our championship winners. That includes Charlestown, that includes New Mission, that includes Cathedral, that includes Boston Latin School for our basketball teams and our hockey team. So come one, come all. And I know next Wednesday we'll also be honoring um, some or all of our teams as well. Um, if anyone would like to make an announcement, Councilor Durkin, you have the floor. Thank you so much. I'm, it's with great excitement. Um, I am working with Zitco in partnership with five local nonprofit organizations, the Stepping Strong Center, the Kenmore Business Association, um, and we are announcing today a one mile to go block party, which will be hosted on Beacon Street on Marathon Monday, right in front of Cornwalls. The public is invited to attend this first ever party for the people in the, in, uh, to honor the spirit of the marathon at a key milestone, the final mile along the Marathon Route in Kenmore Square. Uh, again, this is Marathon Monday, April 15th, uh, from 10 a.m. to 4 p.m. Um, the first ever block party will include a pop-up beer garden, a family zone, lawn games, DJ Tony Clark from Big Night Live will be there. And for the first time ever, you'll be able to watch from bleacher seating um, other than the marathon finish line. There will be a new location for Marathon Monday, and there will be a jumbotron um, of the marathon finish line. 
Spectators coming from the Hotel Commonwealth and the Red Sox game can access the block party on Beacon Street through the tunnel gap within Kenmore Square, Green Street Line stations, and very soon all elected officials who represent the Fenway will receive an email from me, my office, and Sitco inviting you to take part in a special way in this historic and really exciting um, day. So really excited. Uh, thank you to my colleagues. I'm hoping to see some of you there and uh, it's just going to be a really exciting moment for the city and I hope we'll all take part. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Durkin. I'd also love if you send that information around so that we have it. That would be great or we can send it. Um, you can talk to my office and we'll make sure that everyone gets it out, get that information. Councillor Weber, you have the floor. Thank you, Madam President. Just quickly, um, uh, this Saturday is uh, the Parkway Little League opening day and parade in West Roxbury. It's a, it's a big event. If you need more information, you can go to parkwaylittleleague.org. Uh, I hope to see some of my colleagues there. Um, also, uh, on Friday uh, at the Drawdown Brewery in Eggleston Square, it's a, it's a, it's a women-owned business that has a focus on women's sports. And uh, Friday night, I think, is the final four of the women's NCAA tournament. As a proud graduate of University of Iowa Law School, you know, I'm going to be rooting for Caitlin Clark and the Hawkeyes. Um, and I will be there for the final, which I think is on Monday. Um, also, just I know it, it already passed, but yesterday I got to spend uh, uh, a happy birthday to Alice Gillis at the German Center. She turned 106. So uh, thank you very much. Amazing. Thank you, uh, Council Weber. We love Drawdown, um, and so hopefully we'll be there with you. Uh, do you. Did you have a start time for the Parkway Little League? Is that at noon? I believe it's at, I, I believe it's at noon. But Yeah, yeah I think uh, it's, a, it's 11 to noon. I, I don't know. Okay. We're working on that. Okay. Thank you, Thank you Council Weber. Um, anyone else have any announcements? Okay, we are now moving on to memorials. Um, the chair recognizes Councillor Braden. Councillor Braden, you have the floor. Thank you, Madam President. Uh, I rise to uh, remember John Moran, who's the father of Majority Leader Michael Moran, and uh, I wish to extend our condolences to um, Michael uh, and all of his family. Uh, John Moran was a stalwart uh, and very proud father um, and uh, an immigrant from Ireland. and. Uh, he was able to get back home to the old country last, this last year and was brought a great, um, great um, pleasure to be able to go home. Um, so we'll just extend our sympathies to the Moran family. Thank you, Councillor Braden. The chair recognizes Councillor uh, Coletta. Councillor Coletta, you have the floor. Thank you, Madam President. Um, today we are adjourning in memoriam of somebody whose identity has not been disclosed quite yet, um, who lost their life in a sick alarm fire yesterday. Um, in East Boston. Um, I just want to send out my deepest condolences and sympathies to that family and the family of a girl who is still in critical condition right now. Um, I don't live too far away from there and so I heard the multiple sirens go past and um, I was there at 5.30 in the morning uh, witnessing the heroism of our first responders and just want to thank them for everything they do and seeing yesterday them literally saving this girl's life. Um, I just felt like I wanted to call that out on the floor and, and, and just thank them personally. Um, of course, please keep everybody in your prayers. There were 30 people that were also displaced. Mm -hmm. And um, you know, in moments of darkness, there is always light. The East Boston community has come together to, uh, to support these families. Uh, we've created a link through the East Boston Social Center, which is a trusted organization, a 501c3, to help these families get uh, on their feet. And I also want to thank uh, Bono, who helped uh, cater lunch yesterday. It's a restaurant in East Boston. I think a local hotel that I, I won't name just for the privacy of, of folks for um, giving these families a block so that they could stay in East Boston. Rep Madero, Senator Edwards, um, the East Boston Social Center, East Boston Mutual Aid. Um, and just please consider uh, sharing this link and, and letting folks know about it so that we can continue to help these families and please keep um, the, the two families affected by the loss and, and uh, the individual in critical condition. Please keep them in your prayers. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Collette, and thank you for uplifting um, the family and, and, and the life that was lost and for your work on this. Uh, the chair recognizes Councillor Durkin. You have the floor. 
Thank you, Council President. Um, Larry Lucchino passed away, the former president and CEO of the Boston Red Sox, yesterday from cancer at 78. He had survived three previous cancer scares and was the president, uh, was the chairman of the Jimmy Fund, the charitable philanthropy org um, that, that does so much in our city for Dana Farber. His commitment to philanthropy was unparalleled, and I thought I would read three quotes from some people who knew him. May he rest in peace. This is from John Henry. Larry's career unfolded like a playbook of triumphs marked by transformative moments that reshaped baseball and ballpark design, enhanced the, enhanced the fan experience, engineered the ideal conditions for championships wherever his path led him, and especially in Boston. Yet perhaps his most enduring legacy lies in the remarkable people he helped assemble at the Boston Red Sox, all of whom are a testament to his training, wisdom, and mentorship. And this is from Larry Lucchino's family. To us, Larry was an exceptional person who combined a Hall of Fame life as a, ma as a major league baseball executive with his passion for helping those most in need. He brought the same passion, tenacity, and probing intelligence to all of his endeavors, and his achievements speak for themselves. And lastly, um, from Sam Kennedy, the CEO and president of the Red Sox, there are so many of us who have been given a start in baseball by Larry. He instilled in us and so many others a work ethic, passion, competitive fire that we will forever carry. His legacy is one that all of us were taught by him feel a deep responsibility to uphold. Um, not only did he bring Boston three championship rings, every single city he visited had that same success. And uh, may uh, to the Red Sox family, may he rest in peace. And on behalf of the Boston City Council, um, our condolences to his family. Thank you. Thank you, Councilor Durkin. The chair recognizes Councilor Flynn. You have the floor. Thank you, Madam Chair. I want to express my condolences to my good friend from South Boston, Bernie Corbett, who is a member and longtime leader in the Commons Union, the MBTA Union. He passed away. He was also a proud father. He was also a proud Marine, active in South Boston youth sports, including South Boston youth hockey. He was my neighbor in South Boston a wonderful man, a wonder, wonderful father. He contributed greatly to our community and to our country, and he will be missed. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you, uh, Councillor Flynn. Uh, today, we will adjourn our meeting in memory of the following individuals. On behalf of Councillor Braden and the entire Boston City Council, John Moran, father of leader and representative Mike Moran. On behalf of Councillor Coletta, East Boston fire victim, and the entire Boston City Council. On behalf of Councilor Louis Jean and the entire Boston City Council, Congressman William Delahunt. Uh, on behalf of Councilors Durkin and the entire Boston City Council, Larry Lucchino, former president of the Red Sox. On behalf of uh, Councilor Coletta, uh, Councilor Louis Jean and the entire Bo Boston City Council, uh, John Dennis O'Brien, who was the dedicated and steadfast father and vociferous newspaper reader um, himself, of the father of Tom O'Brien. And on behalf of Councilor Louis Jean, Dr. Jean Perez Nazaire. A moment of silence, please. The chair moves that when the council adjourned today, it does so in memory of the aforementioned individuals. The council is scheduled to meet again in the INLA chamber on Wednesday, April 10th, 2024 at 12 noon. Thank you to my colleagues, central staff, the clerk and the clerk's office, the council stenographer, Ida, um, all in favor of adjournment, please say aye. aye. The council is adjourned. <laughs> <laughs>